Josh, do you mean the original or do you mean the sequel? No, this is talking about Top Gun Maverick. Oh, okay. Okay. You had seen the original, though. Yeah. Okay. Which is not very good, honestly. I stopped at Top Gun El Capitan. I mean, it, it, Top Gun Top Gun Maverick is not a good movie, right? Like, you don't go to Top Gun for the, the in-depth plot or the character development. You go to watch planes go... Okay, the real reason you go to Top Gun is for the man titties and the cum gutters. And that like, is that's... not the case with Top Gun Maverick. I mean, there's one scene where they're like on a beach playing football, but to, it's not nearly as homoerotic as the beach volleyball mm. scene in the original. No, this is like flight sequences in the original Top Gun are largely inscrutable, honestly. Like, it just looks mm. like stock footage of airplanes flying around. It's so, it's so hard to like actually get a sense of velocity with an airplane. Right. For the same reason, it's hard to get like your orientation right in a fighter jet because there's just no there's no point of reference the ground and all the other objects are really really far away it is capturing it but it's also the strength of the sound design yeah there's that there's that great interview with tony scott when he's talking about the volleyball scene he's like yeah basically just directed a gay porno so many possible worlds but we got this one Welcome to the Worst of All Possible Worlds, the first and only podcast that is also a gay porno. I'm the Worst of All Possible AJs. <laughs> I'm the Worst of All Possible Brian's. And I'm the Worst of All Possible Josh's. We're happy to have you here this week for yet another case study in the pop culture of a dying empire. I'm not. Shut the fuck up. Get and out of my house. This week. <laughs> All of you. <laughs> this week. I've taken your things. <laughs> we are talking about the musical 1776. If you're listening to this on release day, it's a couple days after the 4th of July. We are recording this the day before the 4th of July, um, mm-hmm. or as I like to call it, the 3rd of July. And... <laughs> We're excited because As you like to call it. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. And Josh has no real sense of permanent space time. That's right, AJ. I, I really like the names you give to things, Josh. Thank you. I was calling like I, you. You put on a gray shirt today and you said you had a special name for it. And it was my gray shirt. The other day I was talking about it, a couple days ago was Canada Day, or as I like to call hmm. it, the 4th of July, too. My favorite of Josh's <laughs> movies are My Neighbor Totoro and My Left Foot. Wait, is it a prequel? Because it happens before. Yes. Well, no, no. Wait, so it's like the Red Dead Redemption 2 well, chron- of Fourth of July. Chronologically, <laughs> the first Canada Day was well after the first Independence Day. Well, um, you can't prove that Canada Day ever happened a first time. Like, that's that's something we need to get very clear. It's like Canada has never been established. Okay, you're right. Canada Day is the Red Dead Redemption 2 of holidays. You're exactly right. So let, let's let's dig in a little bit to, to 1776, because this musical um, is one that I know we all have some amount of experience with, but I don't know if it's necessarily one that our listeners would be familiar with. I, oh, I think man, it, you weren't shown this in school. I was not. No, were, were you, you were? shown this in school, AJ? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, why, don't, um, why, why don't we all kind of like go into it a yeah. little bit, AJ? Tell me about your history with the show. Before I saw it in school, uh, it was one of those ones. I just how I discovered most musicals when I was a kid, which is wandering the Barnes and Noble musical theater section. Uh, that uh-huh. just had a whole bunch of CDs. You would just browse the musical, the cast recording section of Barnes and Noble. Yeah, to see if a new musical was coming out. Yeah, uh, hey, Josh, did you not? I was not as cool as either of you. So that no, was yeah. literally like whenever I was able to like go to Albuquerque, we'd go to Borders or Barnes and Noble. We just alternated, and yeah, and I'd go over to I think. Borders put it in a general soundtrack section. Mm. Barnes and Noble had a separate cast recording section and would just, yeah, pick up an album that was there. But 1776 was never at any of the bookstores now. Well, I was that, I was yeah. too busy um, going to the electronic music section of Schuler mm. Books and Music and oh, picking sure. up yeah. the latest fucking album by, I don't know, the Chemical Brothers or some shit. Grand Rapids people are the biggest like local business perverts, but they make their local businesses exactly the same way the chain companies work. So like Meyer is exactly like Walmart. Uh, Schuler Books is exactly like Barnes and Noble. I found this cast recording of 1776, and it was the revival. It was not the original cast. Oh, uh, okay. It was not William with Daniels. Brent Spiner. It was the one with Produced Brent Spiner. Oh. So all of the songs that I have in my head are actually from that 
recording. Okay. So going back to the original and watching this movie, which was, I think, the entire original Broadway cast, which More is very less, rare, yeah. but it's very striking to hear Mr. Feeney belting out high notes. Wasn't even his first musical. Is that true? Yeah, he did uh, On a Clear Day You Can See Forever on Broadway. Oh, interesting. Wait, so AJ, how old were you when you saw the movie? Uh, I was 16, I think. It was in high school. It was for AP US. So you were sophomore, junior? I was a junior, yeah. But you okay. had already okay. listened to the cast recording before you saw it? Yes, I yes yeah. I did. The Brent okay. Skiner one. Yeah. yeah, my history with this show, I was not familiar with. I mean, I'm not, I was never, I mean, I, I was joking earlier, but I really was never a musical theater guy in the same way that, that you two mm-hmm. were. And I'm still not, honestly. When I was in college, I my final semester, my school did a uh, semester program in Washington, D.C. And as part of that semester program, everybody would get placed in an internship somewhere in the capital. You could either like seek one out or you could just like let the college use their connections to place you if you wanted to be at like, I don't know, the fucking Brookings Institute. Well, no, not even Brookings. It'd be more like the fucking Council of National Evangelical Churches or some fucking bullshit, you know? Um, Oh man, did they have like a big round table where they all sat with little hats? Like that sounds like the Council of fucking Evil. (laughs) That's, Uh, that's, no, they're Protestant. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's much much more austere than that. But um, I got a placement at, and I, I was able to do this by applying for it, uh, a, a casting and literary internship at Ford's Theater. Yeah. If for whatever reason you're not familiar with Ford's Theater, it is the theater where Abraham Lincoln was, of course, assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. And yeah. what some people don't know is that it is a simultaneous functioning theater, which is yeah. uh, operated by a nonprofit called the Ford's Theater Society. But the actual yeah. theater itself is owned and operated by the Park Service. It's it's a yeah. Department of the Interior landmarked building that the federal government owns. Uh, when I was doing that internship, they put up a full-scale first-class production of 1776 using wow. mostly local talent, but then they also brought in two Broadway actors to yeah. be Adams and Dickinson, uh, and that was Brooks Ishmanskis and uh, Robert Cuccioli, respectively. And if you know yeah, Brooks for Brooks anything, rocks. It's for he's he's a great Broadway character actor. He was in The Prom, if you ever saw that. Uh he was he was in Songs for New World. He was the original baritone for that show. Yeah. And then uh Cuccioli is probably best known for his role in Jekyll and Hyde. Playing both. Getting the opportunity to sit in on rehearsals and some of the tech and stuff like this was the first professional production I had ever watched come together in that way. Oh, wow. And it really elevated my understanding of what theater could be because West Michigan doesn't actually have any professional resident theaters. No, they have this giant network of large community theaters that are that are, that make a lot of money and are propped up entirely by unpaid labor. Right. And then, um, and then of stage. course, there's the uh, DeVos Performing Arts Center downtown, which is right. the roadhouse that brings the National Broadway tours. But it was, for me, first of all, really remarkable to see a production like this come together. And secondly, to see it get put up in Ford's Theater, where you can literally look over and see Lincoln's box. They still keep it maintained. They mm-hmm. keep it empty. Some people have, uh, mm. you know, some people... F- think that they've seen Lincoln's ghost and you know when you were watching rehearsals for 1776 did they avoid staging things on Booth's diagonal oh. there, there is a belief that there is a that is like the huh. the ground that Wilkes covered when he was running across the stage mm. like don't stage any action at least standing still on it because that area that slash is cursed that is possible wow. i did not notice okay. that but nor okay. was i looking for it so i don't know so yeah you mentioned that uh, we i remember go, being on like a this was back in the day so it was a skype call with you somewhere during that semester and you talked about how great it was yeah and i i didn't know 1776 that well i remember one friend of mine who I went to church with and he went to a different school in high school was like they, they watched the first 15 minutes in class and he was like we're watching the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen right <laughs> yeah. it's just like yeah, all yeah. these guys going you know open up a window yeah. sit down John and he got the tune completely wrong and I remember it like to this day that you remember like, the this wrong sounds like a tune. song time <laughs> like it, it, it went a little yeah and then I remember the next week at church asking him again like oh so how you know how did, how did the rest of that movie end up and he's like it was great I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like he went yeah. from making fun of it to loving it and 
Josh, I remember you talking about this, and I was like, I guess I should fucking like hunt this down mm-hmm. or something. So did you and watch I the found, movie then? Or? Yeah, I found the movie. I found a yeah. DVD. I haven't ever seen it on stage. Um, my mom apparently saw it in San Diego uh, at an outdoor theater production back when she was a kid. Oh, oh wow. But I, I saw it on DVD. And it was it was the same cut that was on the laser disc. This movie has so many different cuts, mm-hmm. um, but it had cool, considerate men in it. It had the opening credits in it. I think it had an intermission, but I can't remember. And I I was yeah I was I was similarly blown away. Like not totally impressed at the beginning. Yeah, it, it, it amazed me. Yeah. This show yeah. was was very surprising. It's it's a very it's a remarkable show in so many ways, and I've never really seen any musical even try to do what 1776 yeah. does it, it should not work this it shouldn't is a musical work. that no. in by, by no stretch of the imagination should work and it does because it's actually kind of not a musical yes. like it, it's, it's a really play that, it's a play that tricks you into watching it because it's like hey i'm a musical up front let's yes. have five songs and then nothing for 45 minutes yeah. so this this musical opened on broadway in march of 1969 it started with sherman edwards who's not a very well known like these days he's most well known for 1776 right. but he he wrote yeah. rock and pop songs he wrote sizable yeah. hits he wrote for elvis and he was a um, school teacher in new jersey originally he was a school teacher yeah he, he he was a history major he's taught school but he was also an incredible pianist and so huh. he played for louis armstrong's band mm-hmm. he played for uh tommy dorsey and benny goodman yeah, yeah, yeah and then you know became a songwriter and then got really sick of working with the general elvis's manager that he <laughs> one day just like left Left the office in the middle of the day and just never came back. But yeah, he had written for Johnny Mathis and Billie Holiday and all these people. And he was like, fuck this. I'm going to write a Broadway musical. And I think he maybe had written for. Yeah, he had written for a couple plays. But then he started working on 1776 and it was all him at first. Yeah. Music he was writing the libretto, mm. the music, the lyrics. William Daniels got handed this thing. I mean, he was he was offered the role of John Adams, basically. Yeah. Oh, so he would. So William Daniels really was like from the jump central to this. He thing. read one yeah, of the first drafts in an apartment. Huh. Like he yeah. was part of an apartment apartment reading of this thing and he said what the like he's he in in the conversation he has with Lynn manuel he's he's a little bit more polite about it but there are other places where he said it was just very bad it felt mm. like it was written by a school teacher oh and interesting not a playwright you know yeah it, he said it was very stiff i believe in the manuel and, uh, and it, you know it was it, he just random. said it was flag waving and in 1969 you didn't necessarily just want to do some flag waving musical right well um, and at this point too william daniels was already pretty established i mean william he was, daniels he was, was more than established he was a child performer he was in a song and dance act with his sister from when he was like 10 years old. Um, he was in the original production of Life with Father yeah. as one of the kids uh, in the 1940s. He was in the original production of The Zoo Story. I know, I'm won seeing an this. Award. Yeah, <laughs> fucking yeah, insane. Yeah. No, it's really wild. He didn't actually have formal education either until he went to college. Yeah, he went huh. to a performing arts school and when he went to... Northwestern, I think it was. Didn't he lie about yeah, his, his grades? Yeah, they forged his grades. They said, oh, yeah. my grades were lost in the fire. Uh, somebody, um, uh... Imagine oh, getting into fucking got? Northwestern with forged <laughs> grades in the year of our Lord 2022. Well, to be fair, he did give himself yeah. an 89 in uh, in world history, in, or in U.S. history. So. I would have well, given him a 69. This was 69. such a different time. Nice. It was because the school had burned and the records didn't exist, so they just asked him what That's grades awesome. did you get. That's so right. great. So there was like, there's no way that they could have you know checked against it uh, so he was also in one flew over the cuckoo's nest right. and as i said before on a clear day you can see forever mm-hmm. so and that's, that's william daniels the star he's yeah. our john adams we've got sherman edwards our composer yep. the school teacher and then of course we have a third person who comes into the picture here as well peter stone peter stone is a playwright a very successful screenwriter too he doesn't have a whole lot of big screenwriting credits but the ones that hit really hit in their time he wrote both charade and mirage which were both these sort of people think that they're hitchcock movies but they actually weren't uh-huh. hitchcock movies yeah. he was a news reader when he lived in france as a young man then he did a musical based on a jean paul sartre play that was itself based on an alexander dumas play Hell called yeah. keen um keen ran for a few months I don't think it did terrible business. I think that was still at the time where you could have a show that ran for like six or eight months and still made money. Then he got roped into the Dream Girl musical adaptation with Julie Harris that became Skyscraper. That show was really bad. It flopped. And I We're going to do Skyscraper at some point, Brian. We <laughs> because, have to yeah, do that it. was the show that I almost did 50 years after it opened and then closed, and no one else has done it ever, even regionally. He wrote The Taking of Pelham 123 after 1776. 
Uh, he had a number of successful musicals like My One and Only, Woman of the Year, The Will Rogers Follies, all shows I don't like. The original book for Curtains and yeah. Titanic for AJ. Yeah, that's for me. <laughs> but the, 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 the real point here is like 1776 for Peter Stone was in a lot of ways his sort of breakout thing in yes. theater. Like he'd yes. been doing a bit already, but it was his opportunity yeah, to dig into this book. All of those successful shows were after 1776. Right. Right. And he was president of the Dramatist Guild for 18 years. People regard 1776's book as like one of the best right. in, yeah. in all of musical theater. So William Daniels had turned, had well, he, he wasn't warm on it. He wasn't sure that he was going to take the role or not. Yeah. And then Peter Stone got involved. He saw that draft of the script okay. and was like, oh, fuck, this is good now. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he still wasn't like totally sure on it. And he went to um, it was it was at the Broadway 46th Street Theater where it eventually opened, uh, which is now the Richard Rogers, which is where Hamilton is. Oh, uh, OK. And he had gotten the uh, they, they wanted to audition him to see if he could sing. And he had just done on a clear day. So he was just going to sing something from that. And he went to the theater at 46th Street. And the doors were locked. And he's like, well, fuck it. I'll just call my agent and go home. So he went to a pay phone, called his agent. He's like, uh, no one was here. I think it's a sign from the universe. I'm going back. She's like, they're not at that theater. They're at the Ziegfeld. <laughs> <laughs> go to the Ziegfeld. I'll pay for your cab. Whoops. And he went in and he sang like three lines from a song and said, oh, I can't remember the rest. And they're like, great. We just wanted to make sure, make you, sure you, you actually can sing a little bit. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because I mean, and, and we'll talk about this a bit. Adams is not necessarily a role that requires a truly great singer. Yeah, no, it's no. more like King Arthur. It's like it's not totally spoken like uh, Henry Higgins. Right. It just needs to be sort of competently sung in your middle range. It's so funny because that that reminds me of a certain other founding father lead of a successful musical about the founding fathers a lead role that doesn't necessarily have to be able to sing it's nice if he's hmm. able to um, but... what's his name man <laughs> <laughs> it escapes me Okay. Let's talk okay. about 1776. Well, we'll se se 17. <laughs> 17. 76. The, so we're we're mostly going to talk about this musical in the context of the movie which is yeah. pretty similar for the most part to the musical. So the director of the show is is Peter Hunt not to be confused with Peter Stone. One is a stone and one is a Hunt. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't cut that. What the fuck is that? Dude, don't cut that. That's so good. That? It's hot. I can't <laughs> think. You know how I am when it gets Someone like Someone ought to open up a window. <laughs> yes. So I am already sitting down. Um, so Peter Hunt was a lighting designer who got into directing from that, as you can tell in the Mama Look Sharp sequence. Um, mm -hmm. He works on the uh, the so-called Granny Get Your Gun, which was the revival of Annie Get Your Gun that Ethel Merman did in the <laughs> mid-60s. <laughs> That must have been wild. When she was in her mid-60s? She wasn't very young when she did Annie Get Your Gun, you know, 10 or 12 years earlier either. But sure. um, So they called it Granny Get Your Gun. It was very successful because it was Ethel Merman. But um, right. 1776 was his first directorial credit, at least on a Broadway stage. I'm sure he was doing stuff off Broadway. I just couldn't find anything. Um, and he used 1776, the movie, as his first screen credit. Mm. And right. then successfully directed TV for basically the rest of his life. Oh, um, his his last bad. Broadway show, he came back and did the first mounting of the Scarlet Pimpernel, oh. which was then heavily reworked by Robert Longbottom. Huh. But his version was better. Uh, so 1776 started out of town and they, they did the entire out of town tour aside from Detroit. They did Boston, then New Haven, then Washington, D.C. before getting to New York, because that's just good business. If you're doing a show called 1776. Right. Yeah, <laughs> just a few. It just and this is only like, what, seven years before the bicentennial, too. So like everybody exactly. is that full hyped. decade yeah. leading up to 1976 works getting bicentennial fever. No one talks about it anymore. My my mom you'll does. see one of the quarters. My mom remembers like, it. She loves talking about the bicentennial. <laughs> well, and anyone in New York who has been to Shetler Studios, like one of the top floors, you can look out one of the back windows and there is someone on one of those buildings in that block by like 54th who has a bicentennial flag Sweet. hanging off of the back of a building. Uh, oh, here's shit. what I can tell you That's about right. the bicentennial, according <laughs> to my mother. Yeah. yeah. She told me that one thing that everybody did was they went bicentennial. 
That's just what everybody did. What? what? I'm sure. Yeah, everybody did that. That's what everybody did. That's what everybody did. Everybody did that. (laughs) Got to bring that back. We got to bring that back. (laughs) That's so good. If this country (laughs) survives to the tricentennial, it's exactly what we're doing. It It won't. We got five years to worry about that. Um, We we won't have to worry about that degree of cringe when we're worrying about just you know the water wars. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna make a simple peanut butter and jelly before jumping on Uh this call. Mm Mm-hmm. Pulled the bread out. I bought it three days ago. Mold all over oh, it. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Fuck New York. I hate this place. Uh, <laughs> the fancier the bread, the faster it molds. Man too. was not meant to be wet ever. <laughs> we were supposed to live in deserts. Haven't you read the Bible? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm stopping right now. It's true. The, the Bible, the Bible famously talked about how you know they loved it in the desert so much, and they never wanted to go anywhere else. That's kind it's of the, the chosen you know, land. That's the takeaway. Land of milk so, and honey, and not water. The Utah of the Middle East. So um, <laughs> it it did incredibly well in D.C. Right. Everyone went and saw it, and Nixon tried to get it at the White House, and I think it ended up being the first musical to play at the White House. It huh. took a year to negotiate this, however. Yeah. So they were already on Broadway before they performed at the White House. Okay. Did they do the whole show? They did the whole show. Wow. They did the whole show with their full orchestra, with the United States Marine Corps band in wow. addition to the orchestra. William Daniels they claims they just played way too loud. Yeah, they couldn't fit them in the room. I was they had them s- in the hallway outside, yeah. and it was still just so fucking loud. <laughs> Sounds like a mess. And uh, I'm sure, yeah. you know, Nixon was trying to get, like, the Secret Service and everybody to start wearing these little gay little outfits because he went to Germany and liked how everyone looked like they were a Prussian or whatever. <laughs> so there are all these really stupid outfits that later ended up getting donated to like high schools in Iowa. I'm not even joking huh. about Holy this. shit. Uh, I, have a co- I have a quote here from William Daniels about performing oh, yeah. at the White House for Nixon because as we'll talk about with the movie, Nixon actually had a very interesting yes. influence on uh, yes. the cut of the film. But it was a very memorable experience being there. Practically all the Senate in the House came to see it and at the end they stood up and raved and carried on. It reminded me of that saying. Patriotism is the final refuge of a scoundrel. That's <laughs> bad. I love. He is such a grumpy Gus. Like he'll he doesn't yeah. give a shit about anyone's feelings when he talks about the projects that he's worked on. He's much like facts in that regard. Yes, which is amazing because um, he does hold Boy Meets World in such high esteem too. No, he like, really loves the producer of that show. Yeah, yeah. It, very he came interesting. Back for Girl Meets World. Nixon wanted them to cut the song "Cool Considerate Men." Right. Uh, which was originally called Cool Conservative Men, then they did a slight lyrical rewrite. Of course, that line is still in the song, but um, yeah. which is a song which we'll get to all about conservatives and how they suck dick. And Nixon didn't like it, and so he's like, get, get rid of the song. And and uh, the producer he's was like, like get no. rid of the song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I think it was really great, but you should get rid of the song. And put everyone in more fun uniforms like I saw in West Germany. Nixon's um, voice in my head is just the Nixon voice from Futurama. I'm Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> So they refused to cut it. It took a year to negotiate this because he kept wanting to get huh. that that song about being right wing, being bad. What a cut. bitch. What a little and bitch. They, yep. they wouldn't do it. So they went and they performed it on stage at the White House. There's a very funny picture of the main guys standing with Richard Nixon and William Daniels. It's just trying to escape. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> uh you know, it's also interesting because uh, Nixon couldn't see it on Broadway because he would have been thrown out for trying to record it. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I get yeah. it. I get yeah. it. Uh, that took me a second. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nixon, Nixon uploading all the Broadway shows as slime tutorials afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Seventeen seventy six slime tutorial. You're gonna really love it. Prince Spiner was on. <laughs> the it, huge hit, obviously, 1776. Yeah. It won, what, three Tony Awards, I want to say? Yeah, and yeah, uh, it won Best, it won best Ron, Ron Holgate won for Best Featured Actor. He was the one who played Richard Henry Lee. Sure. Uh, there was going to be another nominee. What a dream track. Another nominee for Best Featured Actor for uh, another small role in the show, William Daniels. As John Adams. Mm-hmm. Unfucking. The reason that he was given by the producers was they opened later in the season than most of the other shows. So the lead actor roles were basically set in stone. So right. his producers were like, well, we still want the awards attention. This man should get his award. We're going to put him in in featured actor. And he said, fuck you. I, I'm, I don't accept. I don't accept the nomination. I'm not going to go to the Tonys. Yeah. And so they, the performance that they end up doing is the song where none of the main characters are on stage. It's uh, Mama Look Sharp. Right. 
which is sung by the smallest roles in the show. But understandably so. I mean, John Adams is on stage for He's almost the, the entire character. show. It's about John and, Adams. And, and this, is, yeah. this, is, this is the thing, too, for people who It'd maybe like don't Paul know. It'd be like Paul Giamatti getting an Emmy for Best Supporting Actor <laughs> in the John Adams miniseries. Hey, for the people who might not be aware, the, the general rule with like theater and the Tony Awards and stuff like that is that you are considered a lead if your name is above the title of the show. With that said, however... The producers can petition the Tony Awards committee yeah, to say, yeah. hey, even though this person's name was technically below the title, they still were a big enough role that they ought to be considered for lead. And nine out of ten times, uh, the committee will be like, yep, makes sense. Sounds good. Yeah. It's also that uh, more and more modern shows aren't really being written with like leads in mind necessarily or right. the more successful artistic ones are being written as yeah. ensembles. Right. So Broadway's doing pretty well in the late 60s and early 70s. There's it's doing some well really, now too. Broadway's back. Really important yeah, Broadway stuff. Back. Yeah, Broadway's back. Uh, but the movie musical was was on the rocks by the late 60s, right? The musicals yeah. that people were going were drive-in movies like surf movies and Elvis movies. How far after um, Doolittle was this? Doolittle was 1967. Seven. Okay, um, really close. I feel like you sort of see the beginning of the death knells when you got a funny thing happened on the way of the forum in 1966, which is such a bad movie. It's a very bad um, movie, yeah. So, 67 saw Dr. Doolittle, and then Warner Brothers that same year did Camelot, which was oh, right. also a very disastrous production. 68, we saw Finian's Rainbow, Funny Girl, and Oliver, which... All of those were hits, so everyone was like, oh, okay, the musical's not dead, we're bringing it back, that's great. And then 69, we had Paint Your Wagon, Sweet Charity, and Hello, Dolly, and all of them flopped. By the way, Sweet Charity, you know who wrote the book for that one? Who, Josh? Peter Stone. Hey, hey, that's right. In 1972, Jack Warner is the last living Warner brother. <laughs> he's living in the water tower. People yeah. have to bring him his food. <laughs> he's he's flailing because like the, this shit is just over. The roadshow presentation model is pretty much dead, but he still wants to make this big Panavision musical. And so he does 1776. So this was his personal like, I want to do this. Thing? Yeah, yeah. And it might have been because he was personal friends with Richard Nixon. Nixon, oh, sure. And maybe Nixon was telling him to do it. I right, don't know. Right. Um, yeah. And that'll that'll be more important later. This also flopped. It did very poorly at the box office. Um, the reviews were in the middle and no one saw it. Huh. And you can see next, the next musical Warner Brothers did was two full years later. And it was the it was it was Mame. And the Mame musical was just so bad. You can't even talk yeah, I've about heard it. It's it's, so I've heard it's bad. atrocious. But yeah, this, yeah. The, it actually only grossed. Uh, Two point eight million dollars against mm. a six million dollar budget. Well, you can see where that money went, and that money went to horses. <laughs> Ooh yeah! AJ's horse corner. <laughs> oh. Welcome back to AJ Diddy's horse corner, the most b- beloved. <laughs> Session. All I will say about horses in this movie is that they rule. Ooh, yeah. AJ's horse corner. There's there's a really amazing one where they do a day for night shot uh, where cool. uh, for the yours 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 section of John Adams and Abigail singing at each other as force ghosts where there's yes. just a white stallion that's just <laughs> running in circles having a great old time. It's 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 a wonderful very inspiring boy. to David Lynch looking um, like it just yeah. wandered in from the total. Clips of the Heart music video. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, so this this movie has kind of a weird legacy, but it gets yeah. an early home release. It gets put on cable. It gets shown in middle schools and high schools. And that's, I think, how most people tend to discover is because they saw it in school and were surprised that it was actually kind of good. Yeah, and I actually feel like, but I actually feel like in school settings. Oh, it, it also had a comic book adaptation. Charlton Comics did what? a 1776 comic book. <laughs> oh my God, I need to fucking read that. Yeah, I that, feel like a lot huh. of things in like school environments sort of lose uh, a lot of their appeal because you're forced to sit there Not and like Juliet watch them. titties in the Romeo and Juliet movie. Well, you yeah. know, everyone has to fast forward through those. And also, it's <laughs> uh, that's fine. Watching those in middle school, I feel like that's fine, but that's not... The, I mean, this, the, this movie becomes so iconic for the people who created it. And for William Daniels, it follows him for the rest of his life, right? His When his character goes to Philadelphia a couple times in St. Elsewhere and they always make some kind of 1776 mm. joke, mm-hmm. William Daniels ends up playing John Quincy Adams a number of times after this and of course as Mr. Feeney where does he teach? John Adams High School. Uh, That's right. So 1776 the movie begins 
in a way that is very stupid. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a drunk man filming a sketchbook. I don't know what the deal is. So th- this is the, another thing that actually got way. cut last minute, too. Okay. So this was something that did not make it into the theatrical release. Okay. The opening credits over this sort of like lithograph while you hear... They don't have an overture. They just have a prologue that is an instrumental of the Lees of Old Virginia, right. yeah. which is a, an inconsequential so song. So it's, it's like this long-ass still opening yeah. credits, and then it's John Adams at the top of a bell tower after that. We may not have even watched the same version of this movie. Mm. I, uh, this, the one I just watched was the director's cut. That I also came watched with the director's the, cut the as well. Blu-ray release of 2015. The current 4K cut, I think, is slightly different. I think I watched the 4K cut. It's whatever was on Apple TV. So these and these are both pretty close to three hours. Most of the previous cuts were not that. The laser okay. disc cut was not that long. Right. There, there's a version where they have cool, considerate men, but it's a shorter cut. So there's just seven or eight different versions of this movie because Peter. Hunt just kept re-editing it over the many, many decades and many home Eat video your releases. fucking heart out, Ridley even, Scott. Even some things that are the exact same length, but he's just switched the shots. Mm. He's done a different shot of the scene. Oh, wow. Well, it's, the, the, the man couldn't leave well enough well, alone, also and, and like, bless his heart. Yeah, if you're working with source material, and we'll talk a little bit about like the way that this movie is shot, a lot of it kind of looks like ass, so like it doesn't yeah. really matter yeah. how you're shooting it's, it if all the shots are terrible. It's, it's, a, it's a theater director who got his first movie and most people, if you just like thinking abstractly, you're like, oh, well, it's going to be very stagey. But when you have a theater director who gets their first movie, they want to make it the least stagey thing possible. Right, they yeah. want to use every tool in their repertoire. And here you they can see play the, with the, box. Yeah. the worst habits of something of somebody doing that, because it's just like these like AJ mentioned before, these awful day for night effects, yep. these awful like dream yep. effects and, and strange cuts and things like that. One of the very horrible, ugly, uh, poorly lit shots is the first shot that we see after the opening credits, which is John yeah. Adams at the top of a fucking bell tower for some and, reason. And I think we can also attribute some of this to Warner Brothers also cutting corners around the budget sure. because they didn't have, they were they were really in bad shape at this point. Too. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so Fe- so Fe- I almost said Feeney. Feeney? Uh, <laughs> Feeney's at the top of the bell tower with yeah. Liberty Bell, and uh, this is this is the uh, one and only time I'll mention uh, Elv- uh, Baz Luhrmann's Elvis in this episode. Better but be. There's Better a po- be. There's a point where Elvis goes to the Hollywood sign just to think, and uh, <laughs> that's that's what this felt like to me. Yeah. It's just John Adams like goes yeah. up to the Liberty Bell to have a think. And it's it's worth mentioning the stage show for a second here because Peter Hunt is. It sounds like he was an exceptional stage director. Um, yes. He he just passed away in 2020, right at the start of the pandemic, from complications of uh, Parkinson's disease. Mm-hmm. But he, he was a hell of a stage director. And 1776, the stage show opened. with with John Adams walking out in front of the curtain, yes. yeah. giving that first part of his monologue, Congress is useless, and then you just hear this explosion of sound right. in the pit and on the stage behind him as the curtain quickly rises Flies over this room really high, of yeah. angry men shouting and, at John which, which to is, sit down and shut up. Good God, what in the hell are they waiting for? Sit down, John, sit down. interesting thing right because how you open a show Mm -hmm. that first moment especially in theater but also in movies you need to show your audience that they can trust what it is that you're doing and the way that you calibrate that opening moment if the first thing that you're seeing in a musical is John Adams being like, I have had it with this Congress. Blah, 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 blah. Congress. And, and it, yes. Yeah, that's it. Well, that and then, was perfect, that, that was. I know. Um, and the curtain just like fucking, bah, 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 you know, that's yeah. one way to do it. There's other ways to do it too. I saw a fantastic show uh, at Playwrights Horizons one time, which I've told you guys about with Peter Friedman, who's one of the fucking yeah. best to ever do it. And yeah. it was the exact opposite approach where he just walked out and started talking like he was having a conversation with you directly. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, you need to show the audience that you can trust the creative impulses here and that is not what this intro does because you got this boring ass shit up in a bell tower then you have this tracking shot it's not just a bell tower josh come on you get to see the liberty Liberty bell Bell, which is the biggest fucking failure of a bell in world history i know i have liberty bell sucks shit they couldn't even ring it up in the tower because they built the tower bad and it would fall over (laughs) and then it cracked and we're all just like oh the liberty bell oh let me suck that's why when i was in philadelphia most recently i got a picture down 
stabbing in front of the Liberty Bell while wearing a Mets cap. Just to show you. Tried to, Josh, I want you to do that at the Alamo because you will get thrown out. And it will Dab be in front of funny. the Alamo, yeah. Yeah, those guys are real sensitive. Yeah. John Adams, you know, he's a man of action, right? He's the guy who gets things done, or at least he likes yes. to think that he is. In reality, he's quite obnoxious and disliked. Which even he admits. Though he, which he admits, yeah. even though he also like has a certain drive. Now, I have no idea what that's like at all. Um, I, everybody loves me. So I, I personally didn't understand John Adams or his motivations at all. There was nothing about that character that resonated with me individually in any way, shape or form whatsoever. <laughs> John Adams wants Congress to take action on independency. I say vote yes, vote yes. I really like the antiquated language that's in this. You know, mm-hmm. it's just yeah. like instead of just saying it, like they say the word that he was actually saying, right. which was independency. There, there, there really isn't a whole lot of like modern language, like you know, cell phone or yeah, and, and, and everything or, about the. Um, <laughs> I love it. The clitoris is such a modern invention. Goku or anything like that. Goku, no, 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 there is no Goku. Vegeta, things of that nature. Um, they're, like they're, they're, it's interesting because the language the thing about is not Goku, that, Yeah? Oh. Yeah, the, well, the, more importantly than the language uh-huh. is the thing about Goku yes. is that like because he's a Saiyan uh-huh. and, and because not only is that, but he's also like eventually capable of becoming Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan Plus. Yeah, or, and, I know. You know I know Super how Goku Saiyan works, LGBTQ, Brian, QIA, or however think, they're calling it these days. But, yes. um, and <laughs> just pride and so where everybody's going. Because Super of Saiyan. those incredible powers that he has, right? He can heal mm-hmm. fast. He's very strong. He can turn mm-hmm. to a monkey. He can also eat like a lot of food really? oh, before God. like getting sick, uh-huh. which, and and it'll it'll make him big. I've seen I've seen these pictures on the internet. Don't oh, do yeah. this. Um, yeah, don't yeah, do yeah. this. this is Goku like, gets he gets he he, he gets so large yeah. because you could just keep feeding him food. And, How like, did you find out about this? Like, what, were you looking into this, or what was yeah. the? No, I mean, like you know, you're just like sometimes you're looking up Goku, and then you want right. to see what he's he's capable of, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, no sometimes no. you know he just keeps inflating okay and it like he does have a problem with it sometimes uh-huh. sometimes he's not happy about it right. like, what, what does please he say? stop I, I can't keep eating I, I'm just so full uh-huh. but the thing is yeah. he can always get more full because he's a saiyan <laughs> right and like sometimes he has to go super saiyan so he can get even more full <laughs> even more full than I've ever gotten in my life and you have like Krillin and Gohan in the background oh, their eyebrows oh, are no. twitching they're like uh, uh, he can't get fuller than I that don't like, I don't think fuller. I can get fuller than this Frieza and Frieza's like oh no you can't get oh, fuller I will than make this you fuller. I have five <laughs> servings to give you now and Goku's Ooh. like oh no maybe three servings and then he's on serving four and he's like oh Oh no! Oh God! Stop feeding me! I could explode! And then Frieza's like, I'm gonna keep feeding you. And Goku's like, You can't do this, Frieza! And Frieza's like, Or maybe you can't do it, Goku. But Goku, the thing is, Goku always wins. He just gets bigger. At what point in this have you come? Like, oh, what, he what, thinks, what exactly he thinks, serving? Oh, I can't get any more full. <laughs> oh, I just got even more full. <laughs> This has been. I wish I had seven Dragon Balls to get all this food out of my body. I'm so big now. This has been. I'm just saying, with Brian Alfred. <laughs> Is that, what, is that what that was? Yep. Yep. And you know, what's funny is that that's exactly the kind of thing that John Adams would like yeah. post on mm. somebody's like, t- on somebody's Twitter account. I don't know if, like, about really- that, By man. God, I think Goku could eat another meal. <laughs> Stop him, silly. <laughs> Sit down, John. Okay. I want to get back to 1776, if at all possible, because we, <laughs> I don't think it's possible. Josh is very uncomfortable. And we have not he's gotten almost, past the first line of the first as number. Uncom- Comfortable as Goku Shut when I have my Fourth of July cookout. Up. So I couldn't eat another burger. <laughs> oh, couldn't you, Goku? Couldn't you? Well, I think I could get another one in there. Shut up, Krillin. Okay, so John wants everybody to vote in favor yes. of independence. And the reason that this matters, the reason that you know they need to take action, is that they're all really useless guys. You know, they're probably too busy looking up Goku inflation online or whatever. That's right. And That's so, right. That's what they're doing. 
And so it's in the history books. You know, Ron Chernow has five chapters right, about, right. about Goku inflation. And so this John is like in a bit of a pickle, right? Because he's obnoxious and disliked. Yeah. He doesn't have the ability to move things forward on his own. So mm-hmm. he writes his wife. And and this is another yeah. song that plays. And, you know, it's him. Yeah, this is a singing. difficult moment where it probably works a little bit better on stage. It works a but it's lot like it's better one on stage. song into another, but it's. It should just be one long song with movements, but it doesn't feel yeah. like that, at least in the movie. Because it's like he sings the song, it's done. He walks out, he starts singing it, another yeah, song, it, which is a very like modern musicals do this a lot. Spring Awake. What it needs like to be and what it is when you see it on stage is something yeah. like Good Night, My Someone from uh, The Music Man, where sure. mm. they're both communicating a similar thought at the same time. Now, this is a bit more direct, obviously, because... Yeah, everyone is piddling, twiddling, and resolving. We're in the second song. John is talking to his wife, Abigail, over letters. Exactly. And these letters are, are like, basically lifted from actual letters that they wrote to each other. They're real correspondence. You know, John needs some salt, Peter. One of the big successes of 1776 is that we don't actually learn the history of the revolution. Yeah, it's just this moment. We get like taxes, Stamp Act, Boston Tea Party, um, something about Paul Revere and the Declaration. And so it sort of sounds like it's like, oh, they declare independency and then the revolution happens. But we're actually at war. Right. Yeah. But right, the, we're getting letters from George Washington throughout this. But, yeah, but yeah, at Josh. this point, George Washington is not heading up the Army of the United States of America. Yes. He is heading up the Army of the Continental Congress, the Continental Army. Yeah. And not all of the states are fully in on it yet. That's yeah. the yeah. tension yeah, of these this These are show. from disparate militias from and mostly from like the northern states, right. from like New England. And yeah. so the, right. the, the challenge for John in this show is that he needs to be able to convince because they are all sitting in here as the Continental Congress and they represent 13 different colonies with a lot yeah. of different thoughts and a lot of different opinions. John needs to convince all of them that it is worth it to what commit what could be considered treasonous, sign on to this yeah. idea of a brand new nation state and thereby release themselves from the crown. Which you would think wouldn't be that hard to do when you're already at war against them. But again, like you said, Josh, some of these colonies have a different perspective on this and right. are not necessarily considering themselves right. at war. You know, John then, in order to try to figure out how he can get people to, you know, vote in favor of his independence thing, because again, just yelling about it yeah. isn't working because they're too busy <laughs> debating whether or not to open up a window. Gonna open up a window. Good God! Uh, he goes and talks to Ben Franklin and Ben Franklin yeah. suggests, well, maybe if somebody else proposes it maybe that'll work out for you and so can we can we take a moment to talk about howard da silva yes we, we can, can aj i have some hot takes on this performance of Brent franklin yeah. uh well he'll get the gold someday but in this movie he's howard de bronze i think this mm. performance is a black hole of charisma it works really well when he's serious, but mm. he whiffs almost every joke in this movie. And I think it's just because he's underplaying everything to an extent that, like, you need someone who's bodier. You need, yeah. like, an old, old, creepy it's, dude, but he's so, I, like, austere. Like, that's it just so doesn't interesting. Work I for me. like Howard De Silva a lot in this movie. And, and his, his path to this movie is kind of funny. So, How, Howard De Silva. Longtime actor, did a lot of movies, none of them particularly notable. He was the original Judd Fry in Oklahoma. Amazing. Um, <laughs> which I can't see at all. He he won a Tony Award for featured actor uh, when he was in the Pulitzer winning musical Fiorello. Oh, wonderful. Uh, where he played Ben Marino. He was in the original production of The Cradle Will Rock and even directed a revival of it. He was a director as well. And he was a writer. He wrote a musical called The Zulu and the Zeta, which I actually really like a lot. Oh, um, yeah, I've heard the, of that one. He was in Gore Vidal's adaptation of the Friedrich Durenmont play Romulus the Great, which I just had to put in there. He has 86 movie credits. He had a heart attack uh, during the Broadway run of 1776. Holy shit. Which is why, if you listen to that album, that's not his voice. That is uh, Rex Everhart, who actually later played Ben Franklin in the revival as well. Oh, wow. Um, He was apparently a big fucking asshole. Like... (laughs) That comes so, through. I, I would he say he recovered. In he had been back on Broadway, but Rex Everhart was being considered for the movie, and Howard okay. De Silva basically had to di- beg the director on his hands and knees to say, "Put me in this movie. I want something 
to leave behind for my grandchildren because I almost just died. So sure, I, sure, think, sure. I think I come down between the middle of you two on this performance. Uh, again, this performance of Ben Franklin. I, yeah. I agree that it's there's something about the way that he delivers these laugh lines that feels a little bit, I don't know if it's too stilted. There needs to be a certain looseness to Franklin because of just yeah. who he was as a guy. Uh, right, yeah, you right. know, perpetually horny uh, older man who sort of just has a bit of a fucking like devil may care attitude and it felt to me maybe a little bit too uptight to really fit but with that said I Mm. thought that his energy countervailed Adams's really well and that's the thing that Franklin needs to be the most he needs to serve as a foil to John Adams because John Adams uh cares so much about everything and can yeah. never find the necessary perspective, which again, I have no idea what that's like. <laughs> whereas Ben Franklin is so divergent King, John Adams, um. whereas Ben Franklin is just so like, Hey man, like, you know, like he'll, when something yeah. really matters, I, I think, he'll come down to it. But I think what we see with Franklin is so much more of like the mythic idea of Franklin. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which I think works for this play because you also get like, he's so, full of himself yeah. every time what you see is him whiffing a joke i just see as him being so self-important about his all of supply. his little quips yeah 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 but i just i don't know i i feel like it needs like he we, we need to see like the wit as opposed to like the man who's like already accepted the legend of himself because mm. i don't but know i think he was already i mean he kind of was already a big deal because he's, yeah. he's an old guy you know they call him the they make the jokes about how he invented the stove or whatever he really kind of was at that point already on himself yeah i know it just it makes his betrayal i think mean less because it Mm. feels like i'm watching a diorama performance as opposed to like a living breathing dude which i think this movie avoids in almost every other case yeah and a really important thing about franklin here is like sometimes he's being carried around he's usually walking with a cane not because it's stylish but because because he has gout he has really terrible gout yeah which often happens if you, you know, eat too fast over a short period of time, much like a certain uh, Saiyan that, that right? we all know and love. Uh-huh. Yeah, much like mm-hmm. much like the world's hero Goku, who's just, oh my god, I'm too full. Thank you, Brian. I, I couldn't do another bite. Yeah, let's let's pull this back then to. Uh... <laughs> I'm gonna get gout in my toe, and then my son is gonna be the governor of New Jersey. Ben Franklin tells John <laughs> Adams that. that he's going to need to find somebody else to be the guy who introduces it. And yeah. at this point, we meet Richard Lee who is a delegate from Virginia and he is yes. extremely he's the, charismatic. He's a himbo, right? He's, he's, he's like the uncle of Robert E. Lee. The Lees yeah. go back to the very founding of like, you know, Jamestown and shit. Which is interesting because like, you know, historically yeah. and where this play ends up later on, that's a very important piece of historical context. But my name is Richard Henry Lee. Virginia is my home. My name is Richard Henry Lee. Virginia is my home. Horses turn to glue If I can't deliver up to you My resolution on independence For I am There's a very, like weird sequence of him getting on a horse and it's cut very fast. It's every like it angle seems, you could, you could possibly so get on a horse. It seems dangerous. <laughs> they shoot this at the fountain that's also the Friends fountain. Oh, really? Yes, the Friends fountain. Uh, that's the Warner Brothers lot. Yeah, you know, like, for a split second you can lot, actually yeah. see the corpse of David Schwimmer just like floating around in the water. <laughs> I mean, the thing Does that... Does he go backwards in time? The thing that I found most interesting David about is in all periods those time. horse shots, I guess, the like mounting of the horse, yeah. is that no one ever told me that the shots were going to be that way. Mm. Yep. <laughs> a lot of the songs, especially early on in this show, are very self-consciously goofy. Yeah. yeah, it's a little, it's it's interesting. It's a very corny energy. And if you want like a real good time, go watch Bonnie Milligan do it on YouTube. She oh. sings it up three octaves and it rules. And then, and then I think, I think this is just a director's cut thing. There's a little section where he's sung it and he rides off and then he comes back in and sings an encore. That's also I don't think the, that was in the first cut that, that I saw. That is in the musical the though. He does come yeah, back yeah, yeah. on. And it, it, I think it was just removed from certain versions it's a of fun the movie that work thing. three hours long. It's a tough uh, 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 thing to balance because yeah. that can either be truly delightful or it can be like, dear yes. God, get this man off the stage. <laughs> and if yes. you calibrate it even a little movie, bit wrong, you end yeah. up in the latter category. What most critics seem to respond with this movie, this has ended up in the latter category. I, I for found them. it to be that um, way as well. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why Howard De Silva stands out to you, AJ, 
is because he's playing like a movie actor where so many of these guys, not William Daniels, but uh, and and not Ken Howard either, but most of the rest of them are still playing very stagely. This was yes. a very stagey performance this, yeah. as, uh, as, as, as Lee. After this, we get our first big book scene. Yeah. When Josh says scene, this is almost a full hour of yeah. dialogue without another song. And yeah. it's very, very it's bold great. choice. I love it. it yeah. I, yeah, it's it exactly rules. what it needs to be. It's a room full of people who look vaguely like Michael McKean, uh, <laughs> all talking at each other. And one of those people is baby John Cullum playing Rutledge. <laughs> a baby, a baby mm. in his like 40 yeah. year. No, I know. But like the way we know John Cullum <laughs> know, is like an 80 year old man. So like to see him in this, like, oh, baby. Yeah, so John Cullum, of course, did the show that the creators of Self St. Elsewhere did after St. Elsewhere, Northern Exposure, where he played Holling. Um, he was Alfred Ill in the Washington, D.C. production of the musical The Visit. Oh. Uh, he, he's who you know to be like an old guy. Rutledge, then, is one of the most important characters yeah. in the show. He's and, absolutely. And in reality, Rutledge was only about 22 or 23. I think he was, he was more like youngest. 26, 27 at, at this point. But oh, yes, he was, he was, he was he the, was the youngest, youngest man in the, the Congress. The youngest man in the Congress, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. And as the representative from South Carolina, uh, Rutledge's primary motivation was to preserve the slave trade, which at that point yeah. was one of the main backbone, uh, probably the, the biggest part. The peculiar institution yep. of the South. The backbone yeah, that was the backbone of the Southern economy. The southern yeah. economy. And really the Northern economy, too. You have yes. to remember, Hancock was a shipper. And we get there later. So a few other people who we meet here, uh, Dickinson from Pennsylvania. Distant cousin of Emily Dickinson, <laughs> part of the whole, like, important Dickinson. Wait, was he really? Sort of yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, huh. yeah. And her father was also a politician, right, if I'm remembering That's correctly. Correct. Yeah. Um, um, they were a very politically important family in sort of the mid-Atlantic, more Quaker, congregational part of the United or of the colonies and then the United States. So Dickinson's primary motivation, he's uh, one of the delegates from Pennsylvania alongside Ben Franklin yeah. and uh, a third guy. <laughs> Dickinson's <laughs> primary motivation is that he's a loyalist. He is a loyalist yeah. to the crown. And his yes. big thing is he does not want to commit sedition or treason. Yeah. Yes, and he is played by Donald Madden, who yes. I think gives an incredible performance as Troy McClure in this movie. Um, <laughs> and also, but he was actually, I, I, I fell down a Donald Madden hole because the guy died at 49, mm. but he left behind this amazing stage legacy. He was one of like the premier Hamlets of his huh. time. Hmm. So you can really hear the Shakespeare in his voice. He also did a yeah. Pride and Prejudice musical called First Impressions, <laughs> which is terrible. The key to making Dickinson work and i have a distinct memory actually of this uh oh yeah that during rehearsal i actually talked to bob cuccioli and i was like you know dickinson like how do you what do you find there like what do you think about this guy how do you find that thing and and what he told me is that he doesn't think of him and you can't think of someone when you're portraying right. a villain as a bad guy he is right. a guy who is deeply driven by his convictions and he just believes fundamentally that his way is the right way and the only way and I think that it's a similar performance in this where even though he is kind of a piece of shit guy like it, it doesn't stem from personal malice it stems from having convictions that are just fundamentally out of sync with the convictions that one ought to have uh, it's important to note too that this Dick Dickinson is is an amalgamation of the other nay votes in the Pennsylvania um, right. congressional right. delegation. Sure. Uh, this show uh, compresses a lot of things because there were more than 50 people in the Continental Congress. Right. The room was actually smaller. They made the room bigger and they had fewer people in it. It was this tiny, horrible little thing that huh. they were all just stuck doing. Right. And Dickinson himself was not necessarily a loyalist, but he was against the declaration for for kind of other reasons. One other major character who's going to be really important. And that is uh, Hall from Georgia. We sort of see this guy and his whole deal is, you know, he came in from Georgia and he is sort of conflicted between should he represent what he fundamentally believes or what his constituents fundamentally believe? It's this yeah. classic question of representative democracy. So he's, he's a new congressman who right. has just been sent up by his his state legislature. He wants to I keep wanting to say secede. He wants to d to join the declaration. He wants to sign on to it. Right. But his constituents don't. Right. Yes. So again, these are going to be sort of the three people who most directly oppose Adams throughout in some yeah. meaningful way. Hall yeah. from Georgia, Rutledge from South Carolina, and Dickinson from Pennsylvania. There are two really great pieces of stagecraft that go into this set, one being a calendar. Mm -hmm. That every time they tear a day off, you know, you, you're you, you know, you're counting down to July right. 4th. 
right? Or July 2nd. You're getting closer and closer and closer to that day. And of course, it skips days sometimes when he tears it off. You also have this thing that did not exist, this like sliding board where they can slide the vote of each state towards yay or nay. Yep. Totally a stage device. Totally, totally effective. effective. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It really works. And for shows like this where the you know the outcome of, of the decision, mm-hmm. right? The Declaration right. of Independence gets But it's gets still signed. so dramatic. Like, well, you, yeah. exactly. Because it's like, how is this going to happen? Well, because they stack the odds so heavily against Adams. Exactly. And, yeah. and for shows like this, you really have to make the stakes life or death. And they yeah. do it miraculously. The, the, the really show. important thing, the real historical thing, is that the Declaration of Independence had to be adopted unanimously and they point this up as well in yeah. this book scene because yeah. a few things that end up going down and this is again just recurring themes that are going to come through that are important north carolina yeah. always defers to south carolina mm-hmm. yep. new york always abstains courteously, courteously. <laughs> um wilson like i said the third pennsylvania delegate is a fact totem to dickinson and then hall from georgia is not sure whether it is best to represent by voting his own conscience or, you know, represent the constituents directly. And the New Jersey delegation is not there. Is not there yet. Yes, Yes. correct. Uh, Debate begins then on the motion to declare independency, right? And uh, Dickinson begins by sort of stirring the shit, defending the conservative status quo, strong advocate for property rights. And this also frames up another important thing, which is that at this point, it wasn't even necessarily sure whether it would be a union or a confederacy. There were still some... Uh, states that were and, and that wouldn't be decided until like 10 years later. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but there were still some states that were a lot more interested in declaring independence as individual nation states yeah. and then allying yeah. with regional neighbors in sort of a like, like I said, sort of a Confederate way. Right. Which would have meant potentially going to war against the loyalist states right. if, if they didn't sign on right. un- unanimously. And so this was historically also a big issue. This is like, you know, join or die. It's the it's the classic yeah. thing. And this was the argument for a unified federal union. Yeah. We also have some issues with like the Delaware delegation right. where it's majority in favor of independence. But on one deciding vote, Caesar Rodney, who is currently suffering from skin cancer right. on his face and, and he, he's always wearing a covering for that and he ends up being too sick to actually stay yeah. in congress so then the delaware delegation is yeah. divided down the middle he, he actually lives for quite a few years later but the skin cancer is what kills him after about eight years of having to deal with wow it he does surgeries. vaguely look like Gollum in this movie um caesar rodney is depicted when we started doing the state quarters right delaware was the first state quarter the yeah. man on a horseback was the tail side of that. That is Caesar Rodney oh, okay. depicted in that it's, mint, riding his horse back to the Continental Congress. It's amazing that they would have representation in the Continental Congress despite not existing. They don't exist. There is no Delaware. Yeah. yeah. Fucking weird. The, the New Jersey delegation does end up showing up, and they are actually firmly yeah. in favor of the motion. And yeah, so, it's a brand new delegation. They right. have overturned the loyalists in the they state of New Jersey. They the loyalists. Or in the colony of New Jersey. Mm-hmm. They have imprisoned Benjamin Franklin's son, who is the loyalist governor, and trapped him up in Connecticut. And so these guys have come in and they're like, we're all for it. Again, we're running through this pretty quickly, but it's worth noting. This is like a 40 minute long scene. This is a this is there's and it's the way that it's portrayed, the way that it's written, the way that it's directed. This is the thing that made me fall in love with this show is how kinetic it is. Yeah. And there's so much that they devote to the mundane details, how the secretary yep. goes around the room, how the flies get swatted, how yep. Thomas Jefferson records the temperature and everything like that, which was a real thing. I just love that he has to do it because he's closest to the te- th- thermometer. Yes. Like it's like that's just his job because he's sitting and, closest and to the window. And also how they all get really excited and have to run outside when they hear the fire truck passing <laughs> by. Yeah, it, it really reinforces that these dudes were just like fucking just weirdos. Dudes being- Guys. Drunk, horny children. Yep. They're all talking about how they want to go home and plow their yep. wives. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it doesn't totally lionize these right. guys. And they, it, it, well, and they don't have a toilet in that building right. either. They have to go down the street to use the toilet. The delegate from Rhode Island is constantly just fucking drunk out of his mind on gin. <laughs> um, he he basically looks like a Red Dead Redemption character, actually. <laughs> yes. But, like, you can fucking, like... He wears this Puritan hat that kind of, yeah, looks like a cowboy just hat. Just by watching it, you can, like, smell the air in there, can't you? It's oh, just... Yeah. And it's 
it's pungent. It doesn't even smell good now. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the camera movements in this uh, keep the kinetic energy really yeah. flowing, I feel. Like, it really moves. And, you know, Limo yeah, and Miranda is, talks about that This is where, that a lot like, too. the film, mm. Peter Hunt's direction really starts to gel here yes. in, these, in these sections. It's not too stagey. The camera moves. There are some really incredible moves. This is before Steadicam. Yeah. That either use uh, a track and every single actor is, is deftly walking over it, mm-hmm. or it's used using a, a crane on like a, a, a dolly that has tires. Yeah, the, the the book scenes are actually so much better shot and directed than the music scenes. Like, yeah, yeah absolutely. A mile. Yeah. Um, um, Lima Lim Miranda talks about how 1776 is the only musical you watch and like yearn to get back to the book scenes, yeah. which is very true. In, like, in the movie, it's, it's true. I would argue that it's if electric. you get... If you if you get a good production of the musical, some of those numbers just absolutely rip. But if you do it wrong, some of the numbers are are a little weak. And, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah. ultimately, this book scene ends with um, Dickinson because, again, New Jersey has come back and they're like, yeah, we're in favor of independence. And so that would tip the yeah. vote in favor. Dickinson's like, well, I propose that it actually have to be unanimous. And that goes through. And it, yeah. and and so, it makes sense to everyone who wants independence as well that right. it needs to be unanimous except and for so, john adams because he's a bitch but yeah, like you know the way the, the way that they present this forming of the committee in the show is that it's like a delay to keep right. people from voting on it yet they should have a declaration first right and then they can get it so they form a yeah. committee and the committee uh, it's amazing sings. because it's so improvisational like they're looking at each other and being like yeah we need a declaration right why uh because it has to be written down and this might be yeah. real like honestly, this could totally be real. This is this is obviously artistic license, yeah. but the way that they show it as being such a seat of your pants kind of thing, this is how things get formed in real life. Yeah. And I like that they sort of express it in this way. So now we get to the song But Mr. Adams. This is a yeah. song where So we're in recess now. Right. And everyone's really happy to go home, but someone's gonna have to stay in Philadelphia to write this right. fucking thing. Mr. Adams, I say you should write it. To your legal mind and brilliance we defer Is that so? Well, if I'm the one to do it They'll run their quill pens through it I'm obnoxious and disliked, you know that, sir Yes, I know But I say you should write it, Franklin Yes, you Hell no Yes, you, Dr. Franklin You, you, you It tells us a bit about who all of these people are. It helps us understand why Jefferson would be the guy who they would ultimately yeah, defer they, to on these things. They refer to a guy who hasn't come a lot by using a, the phrase bustability. Bustability. <laughs> bustability. <laughs> Bust, busting makes me feel good. You get yeah. William Daniels screaming, quiet! Uh, yes. <laughs> over and over again, which is an absolute delight. They, they, eventually, what it comes down to is they get... Jefferson to write it because they know right. Jefferson's the most capable writer out of all of these. He has legitimacy being from Virginia, right. which is again the oldest colony yes. and the southern um, and the southern colony as well. And it's southern, so it's you know Jefferson holds a lot of sway. So he has to write this thing, but he wants to go and be with his wife. Jefferson has writer's block. He's they yeah. leave him he for spends, a week. He spends a week trying to write and not doing anything, and right. that's when John Adams is like we got to solve this problem. John Adams uses the one like bit of like social savvy right. he has. Has to be like, oh, I should just get his wife. His up wife, here. Martha. Why does she say that name? Uh, is brought up. So you're doing Batman. You're doing Batman v Superman, but it's like Jefferson v Washington. Yes, yes. Yeah. They're both married <laughs> to Martha. Married to Martha. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch it. Uh, basically, they bang for yeah. all, an entire afternoon. Adams sits outside listening to it for an entire afternoon. Yeah, he uh, falls asleep. He likes uh, to listen, dreaming about Abigail, and they have yep. another little duet where the salt Peter bit is uh, repeated a second time yep. and it references a very famous letter of his to Abigail which is a list of her faults which is written entirely in a joking manner it's, yeah it's a jocular um, like a thing a thing that's not included in this musical but every letter that they wrote to each other were always addressed uh, my, dear friend or my dearest friend Oh yes they were congregationalists how could you tell they, had but, a ve- um, they have a very like <laughs> witty correspondence very they, witty banter she she was a she was his main advisor his entire political life because of course she couldn't hold political office right. but she was heavily involved in his presidency in his ambassadorships uh, in everything that he did their their relationship is one of the great love stories in history to be perfectly honest what's really funny to me is that this also this scene also encompasses sort of like the humor of 1776 in a really interesting way because you have Ben Franklin giving what I think is one of the creepiest jokes that I've ever seen in a show uh, when he first meets Martha Jefferson he says 
whose little girl are you? <laughs> Which, <laughs> but John Adams introduces Ben Franklin to Martha Jefferson by saying, my friend Ben Franklin, the inventor of the stove. <laughs> right. <laughs> And uh, really good. Gold. Martha so good. Martha Jefferson uh, in the movie is portrayed by Blythe Danner, who is yeah, so, absolutely so this is, white hot in this. Blythe. This is this is one of the splits from the the Broadway production. For the most part, it was all people who had been on stage, even if they weren't the original. Like John Cullum is a replacement, but Blythe Danner was not in this production. I mean, she wouldn't have been able to sing this on stage, right. obviously. It was actually Betty Buckley, right, uh, in her big debut role, and she Hello. actually Seth Rudetsky always credit. It's her singing. He plays the violin with actually raising the highest note of the belt hmm. beyond oh, like the the merman line of like how high belts went. Betty Buckley brought it up one or two notes, and it stayed there until Patty Lapone brought it up even higher. For oh, interesting. Vita. Martha comes down and actually has like a full conversation with Adams yeah. and Franklin, and they sing a song called uh, "He Plays the Violin." It's not about it's the violin. It's not about violin. It's not about the violin at all. <laughs> it's not at all because they're like, we don't really know a lot about Jefferson. He doesn't really talk all that much. And she's like, well, he plays the violin really well. I, I, I also <laughs> want to say Blythe Danner is, is very hot in this. Um, I, I, that, that's what I said. Pregnant. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying in addition to that, uh, also, she's pregnant with Gwyneth Paltrow while this movie is filmed. Really? Um, wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. But also white hot in this movie is Ken Howard, who plays Thomas Jefferson. Correct. He is he's serving unbelievably handsome. He's serving like John Travolta energy. But like yeah, he, early Travolta. He's like, he's like six foot three hundred. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Incredibly like chiseled jawline. Uh, just a very, very handsome man. I mean, yeah, uh, I, I Ken would... Howard is someone who most people would probably know from his late career stuff, specifically mm-hmm. 30 Rock, where he played yes. the mm-hmm. president of Cable Town with a K. John Adams was, of course, president of the United States and then Thomas Jefferson after right. him. Mm-hmm. William Daniels was president of SAG. Oh. And then Ken Howard was president of SAG. Oh, hey. not, not, not consecutively, but... Uh, I thought that was very funny. That is interesting. And, and, and Howard actually oversaw the merger of SAG with AFTRA. Okay. So a very consequential person in the union's history. It's always funny to me how actors, for whatever reason, I truly do believe that they sort of take on aspects of the characters that they portray over time. Like there, yeah. there's a piece of it where like, mm. yeah, to an extent they get it because of like they are cast in the role because they resemble what you think of with the thing. But then they think that because they played the role they actually can do the thing and then it turns out that they can probably the well, best example being Ronald fucking Reagan himself well that too I was I was gonna say Bradley Cooper but well, <laughs> there's a lot of people who were in the West Wing God, who were like so fucking oh cringe. now I know how how politics yeah. works uh, and then you have people like Pat Richardson who was like I didn't really like working on it they just told me <laughs> to say the lines and not do anything <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, the, this song, the song about Tom yeah. and his fiddle, he plays the violin. He plays the violin. He tucks it right under his chin. And he bows, oh, he bows. For he knows, yes, he knows, that it's high, 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 diddle, diddle, to extend. He rests the fiddle under his chin, yeah. much the same way that he rests Martha's stretchy, stretchy taint under his chin before he begins going to town. Women's taints too now, <sighs> but no, it's all taints. You gotta have. That's what the taint holder's for. <sighs> <laughs> this is a song for Betty Buckley, yeah. and yeah, Blythe Danner doesn't sing like Betty Buckley. No, yeah, and it's it's a fine song. Like I I I, I get the double entendre, but there's nowhere for it to really go Again, after that. You need for someone the dance. to belt it. Yeah, that's yeah. what it, that's what the song it's exists for. Is you just want to see someone thing. belt. Yep. Yeah. And like that's that's why musicals tend to be more about women than men. That's mm-hmm. why the more this is why this is kind of an outlier being a show that's almost all men. Yeah. And they couldn't do it all men. They were like, no, it's a musical. There still need you to be ladies have, Well, because also you just kind of want that voice, too. Like, the, yeah, the, to absolutely. break up all of the lower... It, it, it kind of falls flat, I think, for that but reason. But the water wheel in the foreground? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what Let was that? With, like, the little... That's the friend's water wheel. Um, 
<laughs> so then, yeah, so she goes up, and now you know that Jefferson's going to write the declaration. He passes a note down to uh, John Adams, and he opens it up, and he says, go away, I'm going to keep plowing my wife. <laughs> and, yep. and, and there's a great conversation that Adams has with Franklin that feels fake, but these guys were so obsessed with history, mm-hmm. and John Adams actually wrote this in a letter this idea that he said, well, the way that American history is going to be told, and he wrote this much later on as an old and bitter man, um, the way that American history is going to be told is that they're going to say Benjamin Franklin, you know, uh, stuck his staff into the ground and and brought electricity to the surface and a <laughs> horse with George Washington fully adult will arise from the earth. <laughs> and then Benjamin Franklin, George Washington and the, and horse, the horse will <laughs> then create a new yeah. independent America. John Adams uh, horse corner. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Yeah. John Adams uh, horse uh, corner. There it is. Woo-hoo. <laughs> we did it live. That's Fuck great. It. We did it live. That's great. <laughs> I do like this moment too. It's a small moment, but there's something nice about the way that we see a little bit of who John Adams is here. That he yeah. is he has some wit to him, but I think that a big part of why he is so driven to do the things that he does is that he knows that he is fundamentally kind of an annoying guy. And so yeah. if he's remembered, it's going to be because of the things that he was able to put through. They're not going to sing songs about him. He's, and, and this is true, right? Like, yeah. Fucking yeah, he pe- said the thing that he would be remembered for was the, the fucking alien and whatever act. And that's so kind of the true. Of. The, alien, the yeah. alien and Sedition Acts, right? Like, But it's because he didn't want to be... He, he was very happy he didn't get remembered for going to war with France. So, But, right, you right, know, right. It, <laughs> with Ben Franklin, you know, when you think of Ben Franklin, you think about him fucking inventing electricity. You think about him... I think him, about him fucking. You think about him well, fucking yeah, French Benjamin women. Benjamin Franklin is such an interesting person. You think about him founding the University was, of Pennsylvania, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. John Adams he, is just not that guy, and that's why I think it's yeah. so interesting. And there's something so sweet about after... Uh, uh, they get kicked out of the Jefferson house where he's just like, well, what are you doing now, Franklin? And Franklin's like, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to go fuck. Like, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, uh, there's, there's a lady. There's a lady. Says, says something like, like, you know, conversation makes her nervous or something. Yeah, yeah. conversation <laughs> makes her nervous. But but he was like, you know, he's just like, well, we, we could get lunch yeah. if you want. And I have been John Adams so many times in my oh, life yeah. in that moment. And yep. it's just like, oh, like it, you really do feel for the guy. Like that's that's the first moment, like besides his relationship with Abigail, like the, the true humanity at the heart of this dude. Well, I think this might be a decent time for us to take a it's break. It's a much better time for an intermission than, than what Mama the, uh, sharp. The, the show tends to do. So yeah. we'll take right our break sharp. now. And, and uh, yes. just, just to cue this up, you know, a lot of people have tried to modernize 1776 over the years because mm. a lot of people oh view it, I think, incorrectly as sort of a stuffy, a stuffed shirt kind of show and yep. not a living, yeah. breathing thing and uh, a lot is of those that, have, is that what our sponsors have done this week yeah our sponsors this week oh, have okay. just sexed uh, well, it up a bit yeah they did there was there was a um there was going to be a planned revival for the encores in like 2016 mm. 2017 and they mm-hmm. they did it all in modern suits and they I wanted to that. find a way you know this was post hamilton's so they really wanted to find a way to sort of like reach the kids sure. and oh, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. decided to uh take a different angle with john adams and i hope you enjoy this because it's, it's the stupidest thing i've ever done <laughs> so here's a word from our sponsor the revival of 1776 the very real dress. very uh <laughs> true starring william daniels they got william the man back. himself <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> By God, I have had this Congress. For ten years, I have sent them graphic photos of Goku getting gulled, cullied, and diddled, stuffed full of food till he's just fit to burst, and still this Congress refuses to give my responses the courtesy of a quoted tweet. Dear God, what in the hell are they waiting for? Log off, John. Log off, John. For God's sake, John. Log off. Log off. John, log off, John, for God's sake, John, log off. Someone ought to open a new window. We're trying to edge to Pete Buttigieg, and you're on a still with paraphilia. We should really get a private browser. I said I'm full, so full, like a food pregnancy. How do you get a private browser? I say Ligma. Log off, John. Ligma. 
marbles daintily. I should erase my recent history. No, 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 too many trolls, too many trolls, and they always shield for paraphilia. Are you gonna open a new window? Can we set some goals here? Leg mom, no, too many trolls here. Leg mom, oh, for God's sake, John Lodoff. God, consider yourself fortunate that you have John Adams posting, else how else would you know how to get Goku that big? John, you like four, we've heard this before, so for God's sake, John, what off? I say show ho, no. show ho, no. show me Goku's boy pussy, I am fapping up a windstorm, I say show ho, what off, John, show me Goku's boy pussy, would someone lock that man off? Never! Never! Dear God! I've made quite the mess. How many minions do you think you could stuff into Goku before he became too full? Mm. Is it too over 9,000? I mean, thousand? according to him, he's too full very early <laughs> on, but you can just keep going. <laughs> Vegeta! How many minions are inside Goku's stomach right now? <laughs> uh. It's over 9,000. What, 9,000? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, welcome back. Uh, that was that was really cool, guys. Let's let's get back into 1776. Um, I, I, I do agree that, like, where we put our intermission break is really where the act break should go for the show, because yeah. there's this there's a clear mm. pivot, I think, that happens mm. after uh you know tom and his fiddle where now things start moving and also the yeah. tone shifts so pretty we, we should mention at this point this was an interesting point in broadway's history where big time musicals were starting to get produced that didn't have intermissions right like if you're looking at the musical from the like post showboat era this was this didn't happen basically since the you know 1910s. Look, and theaters got to sell stuff at intermission. They got to get their money yeah, back. Yeah, I mean, on like intermissions are sales. good. You know, sometimes it's like how you build in set changes. Of course, this doesn't really change set much, and that's part of what we were seeing. Like Peter Brook, uh, may he rest in peace. Um, his yeah, influence suck my cock. set in. Whoa, he's dead, Josh. Bitch. He passed he can away suck my today. Dick in hell. Jesus. Rip to a real one. He died one. today? Is that true? Yes, he, he died, died today. today. <laughs> God damn. But it is part of Peter Brooks' influence because the first show, the first musical, the first Broadway musical not to have an intermission was Man of La Mancha just a oh, few years earlier. interesting. Right? And Man mm-hmm. of La Mancha originally was pre- presented in this very Marat Saad type of way because they're in a prison. It was right. just a bare set and like buckets and shit. If, right? if they so, can't leave, you can't leave either. What's interesting is that these are not like breezy 90 minute shows. 1776 is at least two hours long, right? right Man yes. of La Mancha is also two hours long. They tend to be produced with intermissions now, even yes. though they weren't back then. There was no act um, break in here at all? There was no act That's break insane. on Broadway. Yeah. So 1776 was also presented Without a break in the acts originally, um, yeah. a lot of the movie cuts don't have an act break. Some of them do because, again, there's 30 cuts in this fucking thing. Um, uh, Follies also was presented without an intermission. That's right. And again, that was another two hour long show. And and this movie is fucking three hours. Anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too uh, long. So, yeah, it was, it was just like it was the thing. I think the place that seems to make the most sense when you watch this movie yeah. For an act break, even though structurally it's still like a little too early, would be after all those guys seeing there may be murder yet at the end of But Mr. Adams. It's not quite right. You'd need to cut stuff out of know, the second man. act to make that I work. I don't know. I disagree. But the way that it's shot, it's like this zoom in. You have the four guys saying there may be murder yet. And then it's like, ah, intermission. Great. But it's such um, an up note. That's the thing. I love it after Mama Look Sharp. And after I, Mama Look Sharp? I love it because after all this time of this bickering amongst like it's just so late in the show for me that's, is like that's true but there is because of this movie there is still so much more movie after Mama well, Look I Sharp th- I think for the sake of our listeners who may or may not be even familiar with Mama Look Sharp we might as yeah. well get through talk about that and then we can debate yeah, we still have to get whether the act a little break yeah, is better yeah. suited to well any of these points really yeah so the song with Martha 
ends in that really nice little thing that we were talking about. And it, it ends on sort of like a really subtle personal note. And from there, we immediately slam right back into Congress again. Right. So it's June 22. Yeah. The parties in favor of independence, the northern states, yeah. mostly are trying to pressure the other delegates. But it's it's really not working out. Right. And then yeah. all of Congress gets a message from the front. George Washington is up with the soldiers of the Continental Army in New Brunswick. Desertion is a problem. Uh, discipline is poor. There's a lot of sex workers up there. There's a j- yeah. Everyone's getting the French disease. The French disease. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a joke about like, but my aunt's in New Brunswick, and it's like, well, she's really <laughs> doing a great job up there. Then yeah. <laughs> Adams then is like, look, I don't know if it's really that bad. He talks to the delegate from Maryland and says, look, yeah. man, if we go up there, and it turns out that it's not as bad as you think it is, would you then support? A union. Would you support independence? And he says, yeah, I guess I would. So they take off. They go up to New Brunswick. And this leaves us with, I would say, the most memorable number from the show, other than maybe sit down, John, at the very beginning. Interesting. OK, um, so this, oh, OK. I feel like everyone has a. This show is, is is an unusual case study in that I think everybody has a different favorite song. Yes. From this show. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I would say this is my favorite song, but I would say that okay. it's the thesis of this show in a lot of mm. ways in that number oh, is interesting cool considerate men um yes. now everyone is refreshed that john adams is gone you sing about that everyone is refreshed that the temperature has dropped a little bit like it's literally it's cool in the room it makes a reference to our national anthem right. as well which of course was uh, written in the war of 1812 oh say do you see what i see Congress sitting here in sweet serenity. I could cheer the reasons clear for the first time in a year. Adams isn't here. This is, of course, the song, like I mentioned before, Nixon wanted it gone. Right. And he kept yes. trying to get it cut from the Broadway show, took a year of negotiations, and he lost that battle. And this song has a lot of different moving parts. And I mean that both literally and metaphorically. <laughs> uh, yeah. mm-hmm. Literally, there are like over a dozen guys on stage dancing and doing a little minuet. They're doing yeah. a minuet. And, you know, and the director's cut of this is longer than I think the initial cut of yes. this song. Um, what's interesting about like the balance that you have to strike when you're staging this thing is that you have this number, you have these guys dancing, you have Dickinson singing about how like cool it is to be a conservative. <laughs> sing Hosanna, Hosanna, in a Considerate set, we'll dance together to the same minuet. To the right, ever to the right, never to the left, forever to the right. I want to talk about the thesis of what this play thinks that conservatism is. You know, after after Dickinson sings and it's cool, he says, Come ye cool, cool, conservative men. Our like may never ever be seen again. We have land, cash in hand, self command, future planned. Fortune thrives, society survives in neatly ordered lives with well endowed wives. This is like the third joke about the big boobs no, of the ladies in various musical, regions. it's such a musical, isn't it? Because like, yeah. you also have that with the Lees of Old Virginia where he talks about full-bosomed women and it zooms in on Ben Franklin singing, full-bosomed. <laughs> <laughs> like, and Dickinson says, let our creed be never to exceed regulated speed no matter what the need. And then the other line, why begin till we know that we can win? And if we cannot win, why bother to begin? Mm-hmm. So, What this song is basically saying that conservatism is, as I see it, is it would be challenging to do the right thing. And the status quo is beneficial enough now. Therefore, it's not worth trying to go above and beyond or to find something new or find something better. And this is a pretty traditional idea of what conservatism (laughs) is, but I don't think it gets it quite right, actually. I think that if you want to talk about uh, what this mindset means, it's actually this is contemporary American liberalism. Well, that's the, that's that's yeah. the thing, though, is like I think our liberal wing, America's like the literal the left of this of the Senate chamber is the conservative 
party that we have. Right. The Democrats are the conservative party. And mm-hmm. the 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 right wing is not conservative anymore in the way that they would have defined themselves as conservative under Nixon. They are right. Correct. They are a reactionary party. Um, yeah. But I think that the forces that were still fighting for staying allied with Great Britain, as well as preserving the institution of slavery, that this mm-hmm. was a reactionary mindset. This is not simply a conservative one. Okay. It was a reactionary one. And I don't think that this this the book of this musical as written really understands that difference. I think to it, I think it speaks to a short sightedness or a misunderstanding that I often see with American liberals where they think that the game plan for conservatives is just to keep things the way that they are rather than actively rolling things Mm -hmm. back as fast as fucking possible so that they can Mm -hmm. further consolidate their own power. That's what the thing is. And that's the thing that ultimately people like this would be agitating for and celebrating. And that's also why the idea of a true revolution scares them. But like in terms of them as characters in 1776, there are no real rights to roll back. Does that make sense? Like, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Like, this is being a product written in the 1960s. Se- yeah, the like, 1960s. N- like I, not I get, yet oh. in a position to roll something back because it hasn't rolled forward yet. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, as characters. And I understand because that's not what the song is doing, right? The song was written in the 60s to be a direct reflection of the Nixon administration. Well, of exactly. Conservatism pro- project. Exactly. Um, and, and the Nixon, again, the Nixon administration was a highly reactionary administration yeah, in most right. regards. There were right because he because Nixon adopted the uh, the the new order of the right. That was sort of the, the Barry Goldwater. Right. Type of, of Republicanism, not sort of traditional conservatism. Right. I think this is Sherman Edwards trying to be Brecht here. Yeah. I think he's trying to do yeah. a, you know, this very, because it's, th- this song is so different from everything else in the show. It's really not from a character perspective. Like there's a little bit in there that's like, okay, yeah, this is, this is Dickinson singing. But otherwise I think he's just like, let's take a moment to analyze the concept of conservatism right. in the sense, not, not of necessarily the contemporary right, um, certainly our modern right or even the right wing of that, but just like the idea of what it means to be conservative and to be in a position of maintaining a status quo rather than clawing back an old status quo. Right. I guess. And it is interesting too, uh, Josh, because the lyric of uh, to the right, ever to the right, never to the left right. does, I think, imply at least somewhat the rolling yeah. back of rights. Sort of, right. but like, I don't know. I, I think what frustrates me about it is that to the right, ever to the right, never to the left, forever to the right is such a fucking... It, this song is obviously very on the nose. Uh, yeah. Intentionally yeah, yeah, yeah. so, yeah. right? Yeah. It does so in a way. That's a bitch to choreograph. It is a bitch yeah. to choreograph. <laughs> what you can do is you Your can. Your entire ensemble just making their way stage right, just falling <laughs> off the stage. Well, I think, you, AJ, you were saying that you could stage it in such a way where they like run around behind and then they come yeah, over yeah, they around. They the the stage, look around, just keep going to the right like a, a never ending, like, yeah, conveyor belt. Fucking clown yeah. car situation. But Hell um, yeah. I think that when this musical came out, Mm -hmm. In many ways, liberals were already failing to understand the shifts that were occurring. I think that liberals were seeing this thing of, as the song puts it, oh, no, everything keeps going to the right and we need more moderation. Right. Yeah. Whereas the real project, the project that was beginning, the project that, of course, was most uh, carefully architected and executed upon in the Reagan administration, then again in W. Bush and, you know, right. This is a long term game plan that does not simply exist to agitate in a particular direction, but has a clear goal in mind. And so I don't know. I just I felt I I think this is a cool fucking song. I think that the way that it works is cool. I think it's, it's in the title song. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I find it highly considerate in nature, uh, but I don't find it considerate of my feelings. Um, I see. I see. You don't find it conservative enough. Exactly. No, I I don't. I don't think it understands what the actual nature of the conservative project is. I don't think it gets it. Well, you have something in common then with a certain president of the United States, Josh. Mm. Richard Nixon didn't like this song either. Probably. (laughs) I mean, Nixon saw this song and was actually very irritated by this. He tried to get it removed when it was played at, at the White House. And then... He saw this movie before the rest of America did. Because huh. he and Jack Warner. Jack Warner was a friend of his. Right. Good buddy. So he got to have a special screening in the White House of this movie. And he said, why don't you cut that song, Jack? <laughs> and Jack was like, okay, I'm going to cut that song. 
Uh, I don't know what that. Would voice you like is, me but... to name all the countries in the world? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jack actually went back, didn't tell the director, got it cut himself, and was like, "By the way, it's going to the theaters now." And I've shredded every copy of it. That he didn't end up actually shredding anything. No one listened to him, I guess. But uh, good. He he cut that song without anyone's approval or prior knowledge. And it went out to the theaters without the song. It still very much wounded Richard Nixon. It still really irritated him on like a personal level. But I think level. the strength yeah. of his reaction to that thing, again, belies mm-hmm. there is no reluctance to be bold there. That's the thing. It, it is it is a if the project is not constantly sustaining itself, it will fail. It constantly requires more action. I, I do think that the insight of it does speak a lot to why, like, ordinary people are conservative. Yeah, sure. While still, like, it's making that mistake of saying the ruling class has the same reasons for yes. being a part of the coalition that it does that that an ordinary person would have for voting for them. Right. The Dickinson Which, has again, that it's, line. It's really actually quite different. Dickinson has that line, and I'll just read it here real quick, where he says, yeah, yeah. but don't forget that most men with nothing would rather protect the possibility of becoming rich than face the reality of being poor. It, it sounds very close to John Steinbeck's quote, right, mm. about why it was hard to, to bring socialism to the American masses right. because most Americans see themselves as temporary Temporarily embarrassed millionaires, millionaires yeah. rather yeah. than a, a, an oppressed proletariat. While I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a quote from The Reactionary Mind by Corey Robin, which is mm. an excellent, mm. it's a pretty dense book, uh, political science wise, but it has some really good insights. And I just want to read a quick quote from it about how conservatism actually works. Conservatism is about power besieged and power protected. It is an activist doctrine for an activist time. It waxes in response to movements from below and wanes in response to their disappearance, as Hayek Mm. and other conservatives admit. Far from compromising the vision of excellence set out above, in which the prerogatives of rule are supposed to bring an element of grandeur to an otherwise drab and desultory world, the activist imperative only strengthens it. Light and perfection, Matthew Arnold wrote, consist not in resting and being, but in growing and becoming in a perpetual advance to beauty and wisdom. To the conservative, power in repose is power in decline. So now the Continental Congress goes into recess once more. Everyone leaves town, or at the very least leaves the chamber. Maybe it's just supposed to be the end of the day. Right. And we get to spend our time with sort of the the, the working class mooks at the core of keeping this thing running. McNair, right? we, who is the one who's running around swatting all the flies. McNair, all the rugs, by the way, everybody. is a Johnny from Police Squad. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's right. Hell yes. yeah. He puts the pens in the ink wells. He rings the bell. Tradition holds that he was ringing the Liberty Bell on July right. 4th, blah, 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 even though it wasn't. You know, I was just so happy bell. that we finally got, because I remember. Fucking cuckold bell. It's a fucking fake bitch <laughs> bell. That's right, Never Brian. Never did goddamn anything. Fucking. And it can't eat even three courses of a meal, unlike Goku. I, I agree. Who can eat 7,000 At least. At least. At least. I couldn't eat any more. <laughs> you know, he couldn't yeah, you eat. You said that what? for hours, Goku, you know? and I keep feeding you. No. Oh, Please stop, though. <laughs> at what point does he crack, though? Do you know what I mean? Like, at what what is what is the point? He that doesn't Goku really cracks? crack. Uh, it's more like a bursting. <laughs> How do you think his home planet got destroyed? I was very happy that it's kind of a spirit bomb after, in my gut. Thank you, Brian. My very full guts. I'm so glad that a few weeks ago I remember mentioning Johnny from Police Squad as an example <laughs> of a type of guy. Oh, sure. And now and we actually is. get Johnny from. Police Police squad. <laughs> We're spending our time with these guys, and then the the messenger comes through, the militia guy, right. this this young kid who then sings the Vietnam War song. Yes. Mama looks sharp. This is a song written because it's 1969 yep. and we're in Vietnam right now. Yep. So this is the song that was performed at the Tony Awards because, again, they didn't have John Adams it's a real, there. a real downer selection for the Tony Awards. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful song. It is. And it's, it's what is it? The 2017 fuck. Tonys? I, I, I did not oh, care for the way that this was performed, directed, lit, etc. in no, this movie. No, yeah, no. They're, they're, they're just, but if you ugh. do it right, holy fucking shit, this is a it's, beautiful it's number. A very, it's a very spare moment. It's yeah. a very just, you know, small thing. And you should just do it as small as possible. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's a lot like it in uh, uh, Les Miserables. Bring them home. 
It's it's but from from it's from the flipped around <laughs> perspective, right? Rather than yeah. the guy it's, being like, people are about Marius, to die. Yeah. Oh no, it's I'm about to die. Oh no. <laughs> and here and, and here's what's and here's what I want you to do with me. Like it is very much a prayer. Yeah. This song and yeah. it is. I know it comes late in the show and there's not a lot afterwards, but I think this is the place where it makes the most sense to take an intermission because we've spent all this time with the Continental Congress and the members of Congress and, you know, things get funny, but they're, they're piddling, they're twiddling and resolving. And this is where, like, the terrors of war and the things that they're yeah. actually, the, the things that their policies will directly they're, affect. they're so far removed comes to roost. It. Yeah, they are so far removed from it. And this is somebody from the front lines. Like, we're, we're getting to spend all the time. And It's part of what's so interesting about, like, our revolution as a revolution versus other kinds of revolutions. Because it's a colonial revolution, they have the home field advantage, right? right. Mm. And so Philadelphia is just really far away from where the British Army could get to them. Yeah. Later, they joke about how they could all get killed. But like even that is pretty far down the line because they're all pretty safe because they're inland. Right. But it's yeah. also not that as opposed to like far like. It, yeah. It, but at, but as opposed to a revolution like Lenin's revolution sure, or the sure, French Revolution, sure. where you're in the same city right. as the czar. Right. <laughs> or right, right. King Louis or whatever. It, it is. It is just such a haunting moment. And in stuff like this, when you do spend most of the time with the ruling elite class, right? Who are still revolutionaries. It is very important to get like a grounds eye view. And most shows, I mean, it's funny, like when you talk about like assassins, for example, which spends all the time with the assassins and then they add something just broke uh, to the end, which gets us more into the mindset of the people that the assassination affected, which is, you know, the basic American populace. The reason that song doesn't work is because it comes at the very end of a show that you've been so in one bubble that then yeah. to burst it at that point, it just feels weird like it doesn't it doesn't it mm -hmm. doesn't quite work but here putting it in the in the middle of the show with a, an entire scene around it it allows the play to take on a deeper meaning and it allows this because you're basically watching the same congressional discussion again but yeah. more intense from yeah. here on out but all of a sudden there's all these more there's like ex, the stakes have been raised exponentially mm -hmm. Because now you have a face to all the men who are dying and an urgency. You understand why John Adams has to push this through now because they spend the whole play being right. like, oh, you know, when uh, why we twiddle and now? resolve. Yeah. Yeah. We can we yeah. can vote on this later. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, because people are fucking dying. These mothers are looking for their son's corpses. Right. In the fields, get to fucking work. And that, by the way, is gonna that's gonna happen whether or not they do this. So, like, yeah. it's doing this, it's unifying, it's declaring independence that is going to finally put some fucking force behind this ragtag continental army. The the republic that they are building and in and, and the republican form that they're following is it's the ruling class. Right. Right. These are the members of the ruling class. They're not necessarily, you know, they, they don't have nobility. They don't have titles of nobility. Um, although the South kind of does have something like that at this point. Sure. But like they're aristocrats. You know, Ben Franklin is maybe the only person who was born poor. Right. These are lawyers and landlords and land speculators. And Washington is also a land speculator. These are very, very powerful people. These are not ever the people who are going to be on the front lines. But what's interesting of this war about it at any point. Yeah. yeah. What, what's interesting about it too to me though is that most of them are also really pretty young. And I think about this a lot especially mm -hmm. in the context of like the tech industry which over the course of the past decade or so has had really similar results where you've got these young guys who come from anywhere between moderate to fairly extraordinary wealth reshape right. the entire country in their own image and then in many cases refuse to take accountability for the things that they have created and a better system of government is the one we have now where everyone is at least 80 years old that's right brian <laughs> yes with no <laughs> and they're not going anywhere so anyway we go forward now and we have a declaration we have a document right. with text and we have a revision process in real life. They voted for they voted in favor and then they revised it and then voted on the final uh, draft of it in the two days, three days after the July 2nd vote. 
that yeah. doesn't make for a good structure. Right. So we have no. revisions going on both before and after that vote. And so we see the, the horse trades that happen here. This is where you're making concessions on this or that. A, a, a comment on Scottish people gets struck out by a Scottish guy. <laughs> Uh, from the Delaware legislation. Great moment. Are these all real too? Like I, 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 um, I a lot of them. Yeah, they're drawing from the actual different drafts. Because I know yeah. the thing about oh, slavery, fantastic. obviously, which is going to be the crux of the scene, is real. The hot point, the thing that they end up having to compromise on, is there is a passage that references slavery. Now, of course, this is a Declaration of Independence. This is not a constitution. Right. This is not a law. This is not saying we will abolish slavery, but it basically means you're going to have to abolish slavery. We didn't get that in the Constitution either, by the way. Spoiler alert. No. Yeah. Uh, Nor did we get, uh, you know, the right to vote. But (laughs) (laughs) slavery is going to be the big deal because you have to get not only Virginia on board, but North Carolina, which is going to defer to South Carolina. And South Carolina, Mm -hmm. of course, is Rutledge, who is the guy who we were talking Mm -hmm. about earlier. He's... And you're going to have to get Georgia. And th- right. there's still there's still plenty of slaveholders, including Dickinson in Pennsylvania, right. although a lot of them like Jefferson and Dickinson uh, abhorred the institution of slavery. This is the thing that I think makes 1776 what it is. Yes, correct. More than just a song and dance about America's heroes. Absolutely. You know, more than something yeah. that you get from like a bunch of animatronics at Disneyland here. More than with, you get out some, of fucking with, Hamilton. With some titty jokes, here you get something, an actual, like, piece of evil that reaches out into the audience Mm -hmm. and grabs your throat. Yes. Upon this discussion about the abhorrent institution, the peculiar institution of the American South, which is chattel slavery, you get Rutledge, the very powerful, young South Carolinan senator or congress, whatever. Guy, guy in the Congress is the preferred guy in the Congress. <laughs> yeah, uh, who says no? We're not going to get rid of this. Yep. And of course, you have mostly Northerners who are saying it has to be done. You know, it, and he uses the image of smell specifically mm-hmm. for this song, which is part of what makes it so disgusting. Because the text of this song, "Molasses to Rum." is very simple in a lot of ways. It's yeah. just about the shipping industry. Where do the right. boats go? Yes. And they, you know, they go to the south, they go back up north, they go to Africa, they go back to the south, they go, you know, they're delivering their molasses and their rum and their sugar and their human beings locked at the bottom of the our boat. Northern mm-hmm. brethren, feeling a bit tender toward our slaves. They don't keep slaves. Oh, no. But they're willing to be considerable carriers of slaves to others. They're willing for the shilling. Or haven't you heard, Mr. Adams? Clink, clink. Molasses to rum to slurs. Oh, what a beautiful waltz. You dance with us. We dance with you in molasses and rum and slang. Who sail the ships out of Boston, laden with Bibles and rum? Who drinks a toast to the Ivory Coast? Hail Africa, the slavers have come. And this is an industry that involves the North, and it involves John Hancock, and it involves... Massachusetts and its economy. And it involves uh, Rutledge himself personally. The man himself right. owned over 50 slaves. Which is way less than Jefferson. Yeah, <laughs> way less. It's Jefferson who is championing keeping that line in about slavery. Right. Yeah. Uh, about abo- abolishing slavery. Um, and he's really going hard for it. And you as an audience yeah, member the, are like... Bef- before this, he's letting every revision just happen. Right. Yeah, just happen. Like, and John's Adams like, Adams is getting offended because yeah. yeah. Adams is like, this is a masterpiece. Well, yeah. you know. He's like me. Uh, he doesn't like cuts. <laughs> but but Jefferson will not let that will not let that thing be cut. And he's championing for it. And you as an audience member are like, but you own slaves. Right. That thing, a curl in the back of your head, you're just like, oh, God, this is just going to be another show about the how the founding fathers were like, you know, it's that flawed un- human flawed beings. Flawed human beings. Who did great things. And then Rutledge turns. Turns on Jefferson yep. and says, you have slaves. 
And Jefferson completely caves in on himself mm-hmm. like a dying star and falls down and mutters something about how he's like, yeah, well, I, I've, I've, I've decided I'm going to I'm, I'm, I'm going to get rid of him. Which, again, so. he didn't do the core of the evil of the American experiment comes just pouring out of Rutledge. The entire set turns to look like you're in hell. Uh, this is where you see Peter Hunt, former lighting designer. Yeah. Um, the whole place turns like orange like you can see the dust in the air it's like every yeah like it's like there's fire outside and and going with your like smell thing brian you like you can smell brimstone uh yeah. especially when he starts uh impersonating the auctioneer yep. you hear? that's the cry of the auctioneer This, uh, this is a hideous scene and he is like a demon possessed but there's no possession to him this is just who he is yep. and he is the backbone of america to do it right to really do it right you have to be embodying absolute evil and frankly yeah. defending it right you have to yeah. be doing both of those things you are not just personally an odious racist you are also the embodiment of a racist structure he has a point right yeah. his point is it's not just the south it's the whole country yeah. you are all all you northerners keep saying that you're better than us because you have the slaves but like who's gonna end up building the white house right right Who, who's who's actually building this country it's all of the slaves in the south who we own and it's also a good thing that we do it and this follows i mean this this is the stink that you cannot let off of you now until the end because there's no point that they can raise against it no, he's he's yep at the end of the day he's he, right he, he has them dead to rights and I mean he's then, right he's right he's right about the fact that the north is complicit not morally he's not right morally right not morally he right practically, very clear about that he's practically <laughs> correct that yeah. it doesn't matter whether you are like a fucking abolitionist from Massachusetts or a, a plantation owner in Georgia it doesn't matter this is fundamental to what the american economy is because yeah. of its because of how it's structured because of how this economy has been structured so they need the vote and they strike the clause and here's a line that adams has that is another thing again adams and all of these men were so obsessed with history and how history was going to see them who lives who dies who tells your story but this line feels very fake this line he he says to uh, jefferson and to franklin you know if we remove this line uh, posterity will never forgive us that line is fake They made that up Mm -hmm. because what Adams actually said, well, this was this will come back to us in a hundred years. And he was Mm. off by only 10. Why didn't they include that line? Because it it, it felt too fake. Huh? Yeah. That was why they they made up a line that was less. It's just like it's so prophetic. that It's like this was obviously written by some guys in the 1960s. Right. (laughs) Yeah. This number acts as kind of a bomb at the center of the play. And it slowly starts to infect. Yep. Everyone. Yeah. In the cast, because it's the only way that the declaration can be signed. Exactly. And the biggest betrayal of that is everyone starts leaving one by one. Uh, the doctor from Georgia says, I, I have to go with the South on this and leaves. And that's a huge betrayal because, you know, he's sort of, you know, uh, the new guy to Congress and you want him to do, you know, the right thing and side against slavery. And he just doesn't. And that character is Dr. Lyman Hall, who, again, you'll remember, has been sort of like having his internal struggle between should I vote based on what I believe yeah. versus what my constituents believe. The basic like political philosophy of the enlightenment is raging within him right. as like, how yeah. does a representative system actually work? But the biggest betrayal I think of all is when John Adams turns to Franklin yeah. and says, we got to go rally these guys. And Franklin says, shut the fuck up. Yep. Strike the line. Yep. The look of just terror on William Daniels's face as he confronts Franklin about this is just it's a masterclass in acting. It's like it's this has been the comic relief. This has been right. the wise Ben Franklin right. who is just like you want this fucking done, you throw all, you throw those millions of people under the bus. It's the only way this happens. And fundamentally, I think 
it's the most damning indictment of the American experiment I think I've ever seen on stage. Yeah. And in a show that so many people were thinking are like, oh, it's just corny. It's just like a corny show about the founding fathers in like stiff suits. And like, no, no, this show clearly demonstrates how fucked this it, entire enterprise is. It knows what America is. Yeah. Yes. In a way that other shows about this period of time by other authors do not. <laughs> yeah, which, which ones, Brian? This show is Watchmen. Hamilton is the Watchmen TV show. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yes. Damon Lindelof was like, you know, maybe Ozymandias was right. And we're like, no, no, he was not. He murdered so many. You think he was right? Maybe John Adams went too far. I, 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 I also just think that mechanically the way that this this number works is so interesting because there's all yeah. of this narrative momentum and it just grinds to a fucking halt in a way yes. that you don't see very it's, often in shows it's such a naked emotional provocation yeah. of its audience that yeah. exists yeah outside of the space and time that it occurs in i mean it's like the only analogy i can possibly compare it to in terms of like big musical theater moments is like the moment that the Nazis like come to power in cabaret, I guess. Yeah, the, like, yeah, the very yeah. But that's the end. But that's the, that's end. the that's end of the, the show. show. Yeah. And it's not over yet. That's the, just so the, weird. The, yeah, the only the only I was trying to think of a comparison too. I was trying to think, is there anyone else who ever did this? And I don't think this even comes close, but in Follies when the Loveland sequence starts up where everyone's arguing with each other and then the whole theater turns inside out yeah. and then you just have like a bunch of showgirls singing in a fantasy land out of nowhere. But like this, I, I don't think any other musical has a device like molasses to rum. And then, and then you've got this thing and in, in, in the words of Bo Burnham, it's like, well, how do I get myself out of this weird fucking hole? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, what we do is we have a moment where John Adams hangs out in the Congress after everybody else has gone home. Yeah. It's dark. He goes back up to his bell tower. He sings this. Well, he, he listens to a letter from George Washington. Right. Right. And no one's even paying attention to Washington's letters and, anymore. Right. And he says, is anybody there? Does anybody care? This moment, by the way, I don't think works at all in the movie. It does work in the show because you've yeah. got Adams who is, if you play it's a bad set, if you it's, play you know, this bad. right though, what this scene is, is it is John Adams desperately trying to convince himself that the thing is worth it. Even though he knows that doing this wrong is yeah. going to set it up for failure. It's it's That's yeah, it's the him intention. accepting like the damnation of his soul in this moment, right? Like the the core of it should be that line I have crossed the Rubicon, let the bridge be burned behind me, which musically is like so thrilling right. and exciting and the music then the movie doesn't For I have crossed the Rubicon, let the bridge be burned behind me, come what may come what may it doesn't quite which is get fine it like again yeah. like the, the movie has some issues but i think that the structure but molasses to rum is is fucking like they pretty much nail it. i don't know i <laughs> I some weird crossfade effects but the song's impact uh yeah. it, it is not diluted but yeah i mean adam's here to think about it from like an acting perspective it, it, it's such an interesting needle to thread here because you have to keep the momentum going even though you are utterly defeated as a character. And yeah. I'm not an actor, yeah. so I don't know how the fuck I would do that. But There are a couple other little bits of machinery that are going on in the background, not the least of which being that they don't have Delaware unless Caesar Rodney gets there. Right. And so Caesar Rodney has to get there. And the, as the quarter depicts, the real history is Rodney Road himself 80 miles Holy overnight. Holy shit. On his horse, which is why they put that on the quarter. That's fucking crazy. Um, oh, wow. In this, they they play up a little bit more of his his ailment. So he actually, the, the Scottish guy from the delegation, he goes and gets Rodney and brings him back to Philadelphia in time for the vote. For is anybody there specifically? It is it is supposed to be like, because it is still John Adams' story, right? It is it right. is mm -hmm. it is his big his big soliloquy. And I don't think, the, I, I agree that the movie doesn't really get there. And it is very funny that he's interrupted by the good doctor from Georgia. But we get to the point 
where they finally call to a vote in the Continental Congress uh, on this question of whether they're going to adopt the declaration. And they got their yes votes. They right? got the yes got, votes. Right. They got the Georgia vote. That was the last conversation that we had with the good doctor. They got the Carolinas um, because Caesar Rodney is back in town at the last minute. Right. The Carolinas because they they struck the thing. Now they don't get a yay vote from New York because it abstains courteously, courteously, courteously. Which again, that's in the record every time. Yep. <laughs> right, courtesy. It's it's a great joke in the show. Um, of course, New Jersey. Everybody is on board, except we still have to deal with Mr. Dickinson. Right. And Pennsylvania. And and the way that it's depicted in this show, there's three people. It's Ben Franklin, Dickinson, and some guy. No one knows the name of. What's his name? Uh, Wilson. Wilson. And and, and the James Wilson. The thing about Wilson is that throughout this entire time, again, he's been portrayed as sort of a factotum. You know, anything Dickinson says. He really doesn't say much. He will restate it in a weenie way. But yeah, Franklin yeah, he'll second he'll second motions that have already been right. put out by which of course you by you Dickinson, can't which you can't do because you're the same delegation. So Franklin then says, hey, you know what? I think we should have to call the votes for all of the delegates, not just state by state, but like every delegate needs to vote. And he ultimately ends up forcing it for Wilson and Wilson ends up saying Wilson was the de- deciding vote. Oh, this is real that life. is true. They just had more people. It was just. There were like three people on each side or something And, and what like Wilson that. ends up saying, and what is a, this is a very interesting moment, he talks about how like he ultimately doesn't want to be remembered. He wants to be forgotten. Yeah. And this is this is great where you have these characters who are so obsessed with history. Mm-hmm. And I believe this this part is wholly manufactured. I don't think Wilson. No, but is, it's it's just that they took a person who's less notable. It's not a bad story. It could be yeah, true. It's a it's a, be- it's a wonderful scene. And I think yeah. it's part of, again, what 1776 is very consciously and letting the audience know what it's doing now is it's like it's making a commentary right. from the present day about its history. And yeah, yeah, I mean, for Wilson, his whole thing is if he's remembered for being the guy who fucked this whole thing over, people will rue his name. If they forget his name, he's just another fucking guy. Yeah, and he's a people pleaser too. Like right. he's always yeah. trying to second Dickinson's votes at the beginning. He's a weenie. He's a, yeah, and and Huge the whole ween. Congress <laughs> is uh, like almost the whole of Congress is for this thing except for Dickinson and he's just like I got to go the way the people go. Right. So he ends up pushing it over and Pennsylvania's fucking thing slides yep. to the side of the block and Dickinson and Dickinson gets a very stirring moment. Yeah. He's like, look, I I can't stand for this, but my conscience nevertheless requires me to do something. So he goes off and fucking joins the Pennsylvania militia. John Adams yeah. has a really nice moment where he's like, hey, everybody, give it up for Dickinson. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice. It's part of this whole like mythical idea of like, you know, just people with different philosophies of what America should be, but they all love America. Which, again, I mean, is that real? No, it's horseshit, but like, no, no. And as we, as we see with the molasses to rum stuff, it's really more about interest than anything else. Yeah, and after blowing up that bomb, like, even in that scene where you see Dickinson leaving and everyone snapping on the tables, you're just like, well, this is all fucking farce. Right. Because (laughs) at the heart of this is slavery. Right. It's also just like, Dude, what? <laughs> you're against voting for independence, but you're gonna join the war effort this because actually you believe is, in America. This is That's real. So stupid. That's the craziest thing is this <laughs> no, is true. So, this is one hundred percent fucking sense. true. Like, this is this is just a very dumb thing. I'm sorry. But this is the way that people are. Like that's yeah. the other thing, right? Like people, the the motivations of people and what they will do and why is endlessly fascinating. And, 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 and to be a guy who would be like, I will not vote for independence, but I will fight for independence because my moral, my, my, my moral code <laughs> compels me to do so. Like, that's a whole guy. And it is apparently the guy that Dickinson actually was in real life, at least to some extent. And the fact that, and the fact that like the New York delegation, because New York's state assembly was just such a mess... Very much unlike today. Right. And that's um, kind of an inside yeah. joke. That's like, again, a Broadway thing. It's kind thing of an where... inside joke, but it's also 100% true yeah. to 18th century New York as well. Right. It's just yeah. a fucked place, right. guys. And uh, and it's hot, and my bread got moldy after three days. <laughs> and the only thing that pushes um, New York over the edge is that uh, yeah. they get one more message from the front that... Uh, Morris's estate gets taken. Yep. Now, this is not the Morris of the Morris Jumel Mansion. That Morris was an Englishman, and George Washington took his estate, which is, you know, right around the corner from me, basically. This is the Morris who had an estate that is uh, now the Bronx. But yeah, I mean, um, it, 
ultimately that's happened. And in real life, he was actually out in the field during the summer. He was a oh, brigadier. Interesting. Um, and then came back in like September, I think, to sign the declaration. But the message from the front, and again, this aligns with actually what was going on historically at the yeah. time. You know, the English are basically, they've taken New York Harbor. Manhattan has basically been evacuated. They've fled to Brooklyn Heights. It's do or die. Like, this is the time. And so that right. pushes New York over the edge. Abigail has also made sure that saltpeter has arrived in yeah, yeah, Philadelphia. The third, the other yeah. It's yeah. very yeah. important. It's very fucking So we have, so Hancock goes, goes half cocked and signs that fucking thing first. He Huge. signs it good and big. Like we all know he, so he actually George did. can see it. They hired they a guy. A, yeah. a handwriting double. Yeah. Mm. A handwriting double for John Hancock who signs it perfectly. Again, Adams was like, this is a masterpiece. No changes to be made for the declaration. No matter what changes anyone else was pitching. And then he says, this word inalienable oh, yeah, right. is wrong. The word is unalienable. I know I went to Harvard. I went to Harvard. Which uh, which word do you guys think ended up in the last in the final it's version? It's inalienable, of it? right? In, inalienable. Yeah, that's what I thought. No, we you're, you're wrong. <laughs> really, the oh. final document. Even though the word inalienable is what we use today and is what we reference all the time in modern English, since like Webster, sure, unalienable is what wins. Huh. And it probably it may have been Adams or another like uh, New Englander who worked in the printing who changed it to unalienable oh, because the last handwritten copy of Jefferson says in and the last handwritten copy of Adams says un. Oh, that's funny. So that joke goes real deep. Wow. <laughs> but and this is very important for John Adams. Uh, he lets it go. John yep. Adams yeah. learns for the first time in his life down. he lets something go. It's, it's a it's an amazing character moment. Yep. But then yep. he has that moment. Oh, I'll just tell the printers later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he wins. <laughs> but fucker. But that's <laughs> I mean, that's that's the arc of his character. He learns to sit down. <laughs> yep. He learns what to fight for, for and what sake, not to. John. And yeah. the ending of beautiful, the show beautiful is this really. And again, this is the thing from the production that I was talking about that will forever yeah. be indelible in my memory. Mm -hmm. Is they all go up to sign the Declaration of Independence um, and they recreate the tableau that you can see on yeah, the back of the $2 the famous bill painting sort of from the back. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the th this suck me from the back. And America. as they are signing <laughs> it, the Liberty Bell tolls louder and louder yeah. and louder. And you have these dissonant chords that. Yeah, there's no final song. No. There is just this signing. You have the bell ringing. You have, um, yeah, you have the violin start trilling. And the music gets very, so very quiet. fucking loud. And you by get the end. plucking, yeah. and then you get bugles, and mm -hmm. none of it is like in tune no. with each Completely other. Completely dissonant. It's just the the fucking toll of history and it happening. feels fucking disconcerting. Like, you don't feel good. It's, oh, it's an yeah. awful thing. It feels so it bad. Like a, it sounds like a death knell. And the feeling it's, that it's, I... Oh, yeah, we didn't just forget that we did molasses to rum 30 minutes ago. The feeling that I had watching that, also the first preview... They accidentally the like the levels the music was way too fucking loud so like, oh, no. <laughs> they fixed that and stuff. There was the that was the very first preview they fixed it. But the experience of hearing that sound, watching that tableau, seeing that, and then they kept Lincoln's box lit, and it was so fucking smart. Like oh, it cool. was it was just this moment where you feel the weight of yeah. history upon you, and I don't know that I've ever had an experience quite like that in theater. Ever. I guess we should maybe talk very briefly about what's happening next, because this fall there's going to be a production on Broadway. Yeah, like we mentioned, there was a revival on Broadway with Brent Spiner. Oh, yeah. Uh, Roundabout did it. It did well. Yep. This yep, was a money. this was a, a traditionally cast production. It was all cis white dudes. And yes. And yes, that that Brent Spiner. Yep. Data. Lieutenant. Commander and he was Data. very good. Um, Beautiful yeah. singing it voice. Is, it is now coming back to Broadway because Broadway is back, as we all know. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. This is a new production that Broadway sucks me. From had back. its tryout in Boston at the American Repertory Theater under director and artistic director Diane Paulus. Unproblematic queen. Yeah, unproblematic Diane queen, Paulus. whom we stand. And <laughs> this production <laughs> features all women or non-binary. So there are no men. In this production, uh, that's it. That's 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 the that's the yeah. That's the, I don't know. I haven't seen this production yet. I can't speak to it. I don't think I can fully speak to it until I've seen it. But yeah, I think that part of the reason that 1776 works is the fact that 1776 I think is an intentional. It is intentionally all white guys because that is the historical reality. 
Now, yeah. you can take, uh, you can, through non-traditional casting, expand the scope of what this production is. But I think that by doing so, you create a lot of dramaturgical confusion about what the play means. And yeah. so, I I don't know. I'm of the opinion that it doesn't really make sense to do 1776 anymore. I think it's a show whose time has come and gone. And I think that if we want to be telling stories about the foundation of this country, we ought to be telling new stories about the people who were erased from history rather than Mm. taking an aesthetic and applying it in a way that ultimately, I think, confuses the source material more than it clarifies. Well, it shifts the blame too i think it, it, you have the idea it's like oh well it wasn't just you know the white cis men who did this it was all america well that's the problem is like it's like it, it forgets about the blame because mm. it's like well let's have representation in this it's not like right. let's have a black guy play superman because right. superman's just really cool and like it's cool if if maybe a, a, there's a non-binary superman yeah. or something like that yeah. these are real yeah, exactly. people who actually, superman is not a real guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are real people, and and more importantly, they're real people who fucking suck shit. Right, and they yeah. have slaves. They have fucking, they have slaves. Yeah, yeah. that's fucking terrible. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, representation. <laughs> this fucking like, like, and and that's built into like what Hamilton is. Where like Hamilton is a celebration of America. Right. Yes. Through the like American dream of the little guy who who does of the immigrant. Who comes from the Caribbean and and does well for himself. Right. And not of the disease of America that actually destroyed Alexander Hamilton and left his entire family in penury when he died for a very stupid reason. Right. But rather this guy who, you know, really believed in in the like American empire and that we should have involvement in all these wars and all of this. Everything. Yeah, Brian, like, he's the ten dollar founding father. Come on. Without a father. That's right. And it's you know, it's just like. Isn't Hillary Clinton so great? Let's go and vote for her this year in 2016 when Hamilton is is playing to sold out houses. It's an interesting thing, though, because like this is also a tendency that we see in theater a lot because fucking Broadway, as we all know, is a a place that has been historically inhospitable to voices that are not fucking cis white male. Representation is a real thing. Thing yes. in the theatrical scene because it's yes. it's labor right it's who gets the work who gets paid but why would who you actually makes the money i just off can't of this. understand for the fucking life of me why you would take these actors and put them into a show like this it just does it <laughs> yeah it it, it, it it other than like john adams who is by and large a decent guy almost everybody else in this play fucking sucks shit and is terrible. Yeah. And you, 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 you do this thing where, I mean, you should see what they're doing to Goku. <laughs> yeah. They keep fading him. I will say. He's so full. I think it tells the story that the conception of it was fucked from the word go. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think you're right. Like it says that the seeds for our destruction were built into the foundation. And that's what the death knell at the end is. I don't know how you I don't know how you build a seed into a foundation, but that's okay. We're mixing very our metaphors carefully. Today. Very, very carefully. Yeah. Uh, you said before there were bugles, there's bells uh, ringing at the end of the show that don't yeah. seem that seem very dissonant with each other, right? And that's yeah. the thing is that that's federalism. <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah, well, it's the it's it's the South playing the bugle in the wrong key. You know, yeah. it's the North banging the uh, banging the Liberty Bell, and none of it. Conge- all of it congeals into just dissonant, like piercing yeah. madness. Yeah, you have the Western frontier plucking their their fiddles, I guess. But yeah, I, also, I guess I don't know. <laughs> but I also think that you know this is 2022, and we certainly don't need a chamber musical with 30 white guys anymore. That is not a that is not a need. Correct for the yeah. modern American theaters. But oh, absolutely. Why would we? Why would we not want instead? To come up with a way that we could tell the stories that need to be told in a way that's actually exposing new stuff. Because that was the other thing that I took away from from watching this is like, again, I have fond memories of that production of 1776. I I, I think it's a, an interestingly written musical that has a lot to say. 
Yeah. I also don't think that there's a need for this specific show anymore because it's fucking 50 years old and most of the stuff that it has to say can now be said in an even better, even more incisive way. I, I disagree that it can be. I think that like in a theoretical form it could be, but I think the market forces that drive well, right. the way that the theater works make yeah. it completely impossible because right. this was written in this was written in three years tops, yeah. right? Maybe four. It, like if you're just talking about like the songwriter just fiddling around with some shit for a little while. Right. But like a musical can't Hamilton was the surest fucking hit on Broadway ever. Seven years it took to write that, right? Eight. Eight. <laughs> right. Yeah. It took almost a full fucking decade to get that thing out the of door. Of course, and I get that. But I'm just I'm just talking about like what the world that I want. Like the world that, right. that I hope the could exist, the best worlds. of all possible worlds, rather than the fucking the, the worst world one. where people can actually be artists and don't have to try to be like Patreon funded podcasters That's right. in order to get by. Subscribe to our Patreon, five dollars a month. <laughs> Patreon dot com slash worst of all. I, It'll suck you off. I, I, I just <laughs> I feel so deeply frustrated with this, right? Because while getting inflated, I, I was mm. it was really watching this show again brought back a lot of memories of that production that I saw. Yes. It reminded yeah. me of the things about this show that I loved. And like I said, it also reminded me of why a show like this is no longer the show that we need. We need something different now because we've come so far away. Whether we're talking about what I see as the inconclusive understanding of the nature of conservatism itself, the mm -hmm. people who are actually in the fucking thing and the need for like a more broad-based representation in all ranks, whether you're talking about, you know, acting behind the camera, backstage, whatever the fuck it is, as well as the story itself that is being told, I want more. I just want more. Mm -hmm. And as much as I enjoyed coming back to this and, 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 and seeing all these things, I also found it to not be enough. And I really, really don't think that just taking the same thing and putting a new spin on it is going to change that in any material way. I'm the worst of all possible Josh's. I'm the worst of all possible AJ's. I'm the worst of all possible Brian's. And that means you all need to start writing your musical about the public universal friend. So many possible. everyone i hope you are enjoying this very very hot july i hope you had some good fireworks you could enjoy and if you hate fireworks i hope that you didn't have any good fireworks to enjoy anyway of course we are brought to you as always by goku inflation uh, if you'd like to learn more about goku inflation just google goku inflation and goku inflation of course is brought to you by our listeners funding us over on patreon.com and they include newcomers such as rebecca hildebrand joshua guild wolfgang dresden burr osmara mary margaret tristan and timothy cheney and of course a very special thank you to our ten dollar patrons who are timmy sexton rosie armstrong punxatani newsom noah washington katie wall I Hate Brian Alflord, Glug Bungleberg, Dara Swisher, Annette Alford, Tony Diddy, Silverbear909, Samuel E. McConnell, Nikola Donov, Nathan Woods, John John Johnson, Hannah White, Diana Berge, Ashley Stoneman, and Alexa Valentine. Have a good one.